saying it's, it's time. I ask them but to be on time. If people come late, that's that's all right. But still, um, we have a lot planned, so maybe we just start. So um, for those of you that have not been connected with us before, my name is Johannes Klauser. I'm working for the network Young Generation Germany Korea since April this year, and um, I'm very happy to have you here today. This is the first time that we are organizing an event like this. Um, from the very beginning, we've been thinking about having also special colloquia or, or, or workshops with, with young researchers, um, but we have postponed it so far. And, and uh, of course we had to change our formats a little bit, adapted, but this is our first try and you're all part of it. And we're all very happy to have such uh, wonderful speakers today, but they'll be introduced a little bit later. So just thank you for them. Thank you for, for you to join. Um, I just briefly would like to touch on what the Network Young Generation is doing for those who, of you who, who have not yet been involved with us. We're a group of young people, um, mainly alumni from, from the German Korean Junior Forum, which may you, uh, you, you may know. Um, and we have so far um, founded 10 working groups. We, we meet regularly digitally um, and we, we have Okay, we came up with a number of different areas we'd like to involve and, and we produce papers, research papers on German Korean issues. We produce podcasts. We have interviews with people from, uh, who are quite active in the German Korean field in, in politics in, in uh, business everywhere. We um, just recently started a career service. This is Felix who will be moderating today. He is uh, in charge of the career service. And there, what might be quite interesting for you is, is we, we've, we're just about to launch a mentoring program. So um, we have mentors from, from the German Korean Forum mo mostly, and um, we, we met, try to match them with young people that would like to somehow get into the field and get active um, working or also privately are interested in this, to work in this field. So this is basically all I wanted to say. We will have a little video during the break that would just will describe much more in detail what we're doing. Um, uh, I've already mentioned Felix Wieland, who is in charge of the, the career service. He will be our moderator today. So also if you're interested in the, in the mentoring program, for example, uh, you could maybe ask questions later to him directly. So without further ado, thank you Felix also for organizing this with me and um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and a warm welcome also from my side. Uh, it's great to have participants from so many countries here and also different time zones. So good morning to the US and uh, good evening to Korea. In Germany, we are around noon time. Today, let me briefly touch up on the agenda. So we will start with uh, welcoming remarks from Mr. Hartmut Koschik. Then we will have a brief moment to take a joint picture for our social media activities. And we will use this as an opportunity for a round of introduction that we get to know each other. As next, we will hand over to our two guest speakers, uh, Professor Deville and Dr. Zillinger, who have uh, presentations uh, prepared for today. And I will introduce each speaker uh, directly before uh, we hand over to them. And we will have a discussion, a short break. And then we have three presentations for which we are very grateful. We have a young researcher and expert session on risk and risk management. And afterwards, we will conclude and uh, we hope that this will be interesting and of value for you today. I would now like to hand over to Mr. Hartmut Koschik, who is a former parliamentary undersecretary in the German Federal Ministry of Finance and was also the German co-chair of the German Korean Forum and to whom we are very much indebted for his support of our course of our network. Mr. Koschik. Yeah, thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Felix, for giving me the opportunity to make some remarks uh, for opening this first young expert colloquium. And I'm very happy that uh, Professor Volker de Will from the University of Bayreuth and my friend, Professor Bernhard Seliger from the Hans Seidel Foundation in Seoul is also engaged in this colloquium. Distinguished young professionals and experts and dear members and friends of our network. When we first gathered ideas on what kind of activities a German Korean youth network like ours engage in, 
regarding scientific exchange, the idea of promoting the German-Korean young expert exchange through workshops soon came to mind. At that time, we had planned a totally different format. We are aware that digital meetups cannot fully substitute for offline experiences and personal acquaintance. We are aware that we have sooner or later to be able to once again physically unite young researchers and scholars from both countries and engage in fruitful discussions, wringing out their smart brains in debating and hopefully even meeting some of our society's most pressing challenges together. We want to help building strong professional networks and hope to see personal friendships developing. But like everybody, we had to adapt our format to the current realities. What we had digitally planned with you today there before is a good start and the best we can do at the time being. I sincerely hope this event will be a first milestone in a series of encounters and we will soon be able to also come together in real life again. Just one year ago, for most of us, pandemia was quite an abstract risk. Within the German Korean Forum, we held a session on global health discussing Korea's experiences from MERS and SARS in autumn 2019. However, I'm quite sure none one of us expected to see a few months later a virus like COVID-19 disrupting our way of life and work and indeed the way we hold workshops for young experts from around the world. No doubt, COVID-19 has changed our consciousness. It has pointed out the increasing vulnerability of our globalized world and interconnected societies. Pandemia was probably the most underestimated risk of our time. Therefore, I'm glad that in our first Young Expert Exchange, we will now look at risk management in a world under the spell of COVID-19. It may not be a coincidence that it was the co-founder of medical microbiology, Louis Pasteur, who in his lifetime greatly contributed to finding contagious diseases through vaccination, who said, change favors the prepared mind. It is true. You will live your life to operate your business much more relaxed if you have a contingency plans for all kinds of risk prepared in your drawer. As experts on risk management, you probably also know the quote of Gary Cohn, the former COO of Goldman Sachs and former director of the National Economic Council. If you don't invest in risk management, in risk management, it doesn't matter what business you are in, it's a risky business. So I thank you all for deciding to invest your time wisely to, to participate in today's event. Thank you for uh, the preparation, Felix Wieland and uh, Johannes Klauser for moderating and organizing this meaningful and timely colloquium. Thank you to Professor De Ville and Professor Seliger for his presentations. Thank you all for your attention and um, I wish this colloquium a lot of success and best results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Koshik. Um, we are very happy to have you with us today. And as a next step, I think we would then hand over to our photo, which we would like to take for social media.
Maybe, maybe um, we, we all can say kimchi. Kimchi, kimchi helps. Yeah, kimchi helps. <laughs> Anna, two, set, kimchi. kimchi. <laughs> All right, it should work. Please, I think you can continue. Okay, perfect. So our next step is a short round of introductions that we get to know each other. It would be great if you can briefly state your name and what made you come join us today? What are you looking for? Um, I would begin. My name is Felix Wieland. I had the opportunity to study at KAIST in South Korea 2015. And during this time, there was a MERS outbreak. So uh, it was the first time I ever came close to something like a, a pandemic situation. And for me, risk management is not only personally interesting, but also professionally. If you run any kind of projects, you have to look into how you deal with risks, with kind of risks appear and how you handle and mitigate them. And therefore, I'm very happy that we have an introduction to different aspects of risk management and also to political risks that face Korea um, today. And I'm very much looking forward to the exchange. I would hand over now to Johannes. My name is Johannes Klauser. I've already introduced myself a little bit. Um, I'm probably the only one who had to be here. So it was not the topic that brought me here, but the organization. And uh, I was uh, very happy to, to help organize this with, with uh, those giving input here today, uh, and, and this is also how, how the topic uh, came to me, so to speak. So I'm not an expert on, on risk management, but I'm thrilled to, to have learned some, some more things, and, and I think I'll become an expert after this meeting. Please uh, hand over. To Felix, you, you choose the next person to yes. introduce themselves. Henry, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Hi, my name is Hyunjung Kim in Korean, and English name Henry. And I'm a PhD candidate in biodefense program in George Mason University in the United States. Uh, I'm very honored to be here and happy to share my idea with all you guys here. And hopefully we have a good time and share interesting ideas with each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alizea, would you like to proceed? Uh, yes, hello. My name is Alicia Music. I recently came back from Korea for my exchange year and this was also during a pandemic. <laughs> and um, I was invited by Johannes and I'm studying international business law and business management and therefore it's quite interesting for me to hear different opinions on this topic of risk management. Thank you very much. Lisa, would you like to proceed? Me? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. Um, my name is Lisa Brachnov. I'm currently writing my bachelor thesis in Bochum in East Asian politics and economics. Um, and I just got into, I, sorry, I was um, a participant in the Digital Junior Forum, uh, which is also why I heard of this um, uh, event today. Um, I don't know much about risk management so far, but I'm really excited to learn more today. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Then Dr. Xie, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yes, that's okay. Uh, Xie is my last name. So my name is Himao Xie. So I'm currently Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship in SUNY Korea here in uh, Incheon, South Korea. Um, I'm very, although I'm not a I'm not a PhD student. I'm very uh, happy to get a chance to attend this uh, colloquium. Uh, my original background is my, my PhD is in strategy from Washington University in St. Louis. And um, before this, uh, before coming to Korea in 2014, I spent five years at the University of Amsterdam as an assistant professor and was tenured there uh, in the School of Economics. Uh, most recently, I've been doing research on risk um, in, uh, in relation to entrepreneurship. So all of my research is in entrepreneurship. And uh, most notably, I have a paper in small business economics uh, about a few years ago that looks at the uh, relationship between balanced skills and entrepreneurship uh, in terms of risk. Great to have you with us. Thank you very much. And then we would hand over to Jan Robin. Uh, yes, uh, I'm a master student at uh, Ruhr Universität uh, Bochum. I heard of this um, event over our mailing list and I'm here for risks and risk perception, etc. Um, because I'm interested in applying that to my own uh, 
research, which is currently focused on uh, Japan, uh, because I hadn't had yet any chance to really get into Korea. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great to have you with us. Then maybe Kamir, could you say something about yourself? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, my name is Kamil. I'm an active member of the network since August uh, last year. I'm currently in charge of the network's working group three, uh, which maybe for you who don't know, which is responsible for propositions and uh, recommendations to the stakeholders from politics, science and economics through the lens of uh, the young generation. And um, yeah, maybe in real life, I can say <laughs> I'm a researcher and lecturer at the public uh, at the School of Public Health at University of Bielefeld. Um, I've been researching on relationships between social conditions and health in South Korea for almost 10 years. And recently, I have also been working on risk communication in this context and in the context of Corona pandemics. And um, in addition, I am researching on community resilience and Corona in South Korea. So for today, I'm just interested in the topic as it is uh, connected to my research. Um, yeah, that's all about me for now. Thank you very much. Then let's proceed with Natalie for cut. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Natalie. I am finishing my master's studies at Freie Universität Berlin. At the moment, I, and I decided to take part in this um, colloquium because um, I was also quite um, impacted by this pandemic. As um, last semester, I spent at KDI School of Public Policy and Management in South Korea, however, online. So, um, because my visa was canceled the last minute. Um, but actually, um, yeah, my focus is in development, pol development policy, North Korean nuclear politics and also um, just transnational, transnational mobility and globalization in general. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. So then we can proceed with Julie Kim. Um, hello, my name is Julie Kim and I'm at, in the Department of Geography at Seoul National University at the moment. Um, did I say I'm a PhD student? I, I don't remember. Um, but uh, so I am here because I, found this event through a Facebook group of the Koreanists and um, and I am currently studying migration and immigration and um, I am trying to develop a paper regarding the immigration sort of status in in South Korea regarding with the uh, in relation with to COVID-19 and I wanted sort of an outlet sort of an international outlet and see how different opinion uh, how what sort of scope of ideas I could receive or comment because I've only really been um, studying within the Korean sort of background for a long time. So I am very interested to hear everyone's ideas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. The next one, Lisi, I hope I pronounced this correctly. Uh, you are you Me, yeah. yeah. Correct. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, nice to meet you, or guys. And um, I, I am a recent uh, graduate of uh, Korea uh, University Global MBA, and um, I uh, especially concentrated on marketing and strategy. And I was very interested in today's topic, so I was invited uh, just yesterday. And then, <laughs> and um, I also, uh, my uh, undergraduate major uh, was also in uh, uh, Germany. So I'm very happy to join today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Then we could proceed with Florian Perking. Hello, good morning and evening and afternoon, everyone. My name is Florian Kölking, and I'm a researcher lecturer at um, East Asian Politics and Korean Studies at Ruhr University Bochum. Um, until now, I haven't been actively connected to the network, but I'm going to change that or trying to change that. Um, thanks to our former student, Johanna, who was co-hosting the event, uh, as I see it. Um, I am not particularly interested in risk management, but my interest lies in um, Korean uh, international political economy, so 
um, risk management is definitely one aspect of it. And um, I'm looking forward to um, joining this and the following events. See how we can um, on different levels connect to each other. Thank you very much. Then Ben from Trek. Hello, thank you for hosting today's event. My name is Ben van Treek. Uh, I'm, I was a participant at the special online forum and uh, today I'm um, basically here because I think the topic is right now very important and interesting and I'm happy for the input. For me, the term risk is much more connected actually to environmental issues and because I'm living in a state by the coast, it's more about embankment and how to protect the ocean getting over <laughs> Um, rolling over the country. So for me, the term risk is not so much in the sense of the crisis. So I'm happy to learn something new today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then we would hand over to Elif. Hello, everyone. My name is Elif and I'm a student at the University of Bochum. Mr. Perkin is my lecturer, so I found out uh, through him. Um, I'm studying um, East Asian politics with uh, a focus on Korea and I minored in Chinese and Korean studies. I studied in Korea uh, for a year before the pandemic, thankfully. Um, I don't know much about risk management to be honest, but I was just interested because of the COVID pandemic, it was very timely and I also haven't been connected to this network yet, but I hope to change that. Great, thank you very much. Then we can proceed with Diana. Hello, everyone. My name is Diana Schüler. I am also a member of the network and active in uh, two working groups. But uh, in real life, I am a research associate at the University of Duisburg Essen at the chair of East Asian Economics, um, Japan and Korea. And I am focusing on the Korean economy. And I wrote my PhD thesis about entrepreneurship in Korea. I was part of the research training group Risk in East Asia. So Risk was also part of my dissertation. And currently I'm actually also working on a paper related to um, how entrepreneurs in Korea reacted to the current pandemic in terms of how they changed their working style and how they adapted to the crisis. So that's why I find this, um, beside being a member of this uh, network, but beside that, I find it interesting to um, be here today and listen to um, talks about this, um, yeah, about this topic. Thank you very much. We can proceed with Rebecca Reinecke. Uh, yes, hello, my name is Rebecca. I'm a former intern of the Hans Eidel Foundation in Seoul. I've been there last year from February until April, and that's how I knew about this event today. Um, also, I attended the Digital Junior Forum, which I thought was really interesting. And I think today is a great opportunity to get in deeper into um, the topic of risk management. I'm a student of political science, and I'm working as a political strategy consultant. Um, and our projects also relate uh, to risk management during the corona pandemic uh, today. So I think that's a great opportunity to connect um, some knowledge. Thank you very much. Then we proceed with Tobias. Hello, my name is Tobias Kaccio. I am a German attorney at law, uh, working for the law firm of Kahu Legal, but also as an in-house legal counsel at the major German automotive company and I will be speaking today on the topic of legal aspects of risk management. I personally have a very broad definition of risk management insofar as I think that every company employee is to some extent a risk manager, but I will talk more about that later. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then to Hannah. Sorry, I wasn't sure if it's Johanna or Hannah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am Hannah from South Korea. And um, actually, like, I was born in Germany. That's why my parents named me Hannah. So if there's always a German and Korean exchange, I'm always interested. And currently, I'm a PhD candidate at Seoul National University. I'm really happy to meet you, Hulihim. I think we, maybe we can meet in person at the campus soon. 
So I major in communication and I'm also working at the fact-checking center at our faculty. So to be honest, I'm also not directly connected with risk management, but I was really intrigued with this word, different perspectives. And it's so happy to see so many friends who is interested or researching in Korea. And thank you so much. Thank you very much as well. Then to Max Altenhofen. Hello, my name is Max Altenhofen. I'm currently a PhD student at Tübingen University and in the Korean studies department, but not necessarily concerned with uh, risk management, but I'm interested to learn something new about this today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then to you, Hanna. <laughs> Hello, I'm Johanna. I'm a member of the network. Um, I'm in various uh, working groups. I won't count them now, but yeah, um, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm actually a student at the Real University Bochum as well. I'm, I'm specialized in uh, politics of East Asia, more likely focus on Korea. So I'm very interested in the topic today and I hope I can learn a lot. Thank you very mm. much. Thank you very much. And if you've got it, I think we only miss two more, which are Professor DeVille and uh, Dr. Selinger. And I prepared a short introduction for you as well, but then I would hand over to you. But before we do so, I wanted to introduce one thought which I found very interesting. I recently read an article in The Economist um, which compared how can the pandemic can be seen as a risk. And the Economist article was had the headline, was the pandemic a gray Reno or Plex One? And it makes the reference to two uh, metaphors. One is the Plex One event, a metaphor coined by Nassim Taleb, describing something that is so remote and unimaginable that we don't expect it at all. And then there is a book published by Michelle Vuka describing rare events, which are actually not so rare. And she uses the image of a gray Reno, which is actually pretty vivid and large and visible and it better not comes after you. And the question this article provoked was, was the pandemic really so unforeseeable? The article draws comparisons to climate change. We all see the buildup, we have seen the weather statistics, we know how the polls are evolving and asked, um, are we becoming more resilient? Are, you, are we preparing ourselves? Is this the way we should deal with risks when we know there are risks that are likely it's a question of when, not if they will occur, and how as a society are we going to prepare ourselves. Now, I would actually like to hand over to Professor DeVille. Um, Professor DeVille is an honorary professor of, for international management at the University of Bayreuth. You are the member of the Korean Germ Forum as well, and you are the president of the FL Think Tank in Munich. You have been an executive at Allianz, having studied mathematics and economics before. And we are very much looking forward to your presentation to an introduction to different aspects of risk and risk management. The floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, let me try whether you can see my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I, I have now uh, the task in 20 minutes or 25 minutes to explain from a global uh, view all the risk uh, humans and human societies can face. So let me try uh, to do that. This is the overall um, picture on uh, which types of risk we may face. And I will go through that uh, once and then show you afterwards some examples, not all of them uh, to look into details. So on the left side, the natural risk the first ones are tectonics, like earthquakes, volcanoes, and or tsunamis. This is not a small risk. If you remember, 10 years ago, we had a tsunami in the Indian Ocean with more than 200,000 people dying. That is as much as in the corona pandemics. So that can be a big risk. The next ones are astronomic risks. Um, meteors or asteroids, if they come to uh, the Earth, um, then uh, it may be the end of our civilization. But uh, happily, that is a very, very rare event. Only some million years, um, we need to have one of them in a, a sizable uh, way. 
but solar storms um, uh, coming uh, electrons coming from the um, from our sun they can disturb our power grids and they can even destroy power grids so we have to make sure that our um, uh, grids are safe against that meteorological risk and climate risks i will come to that in some detail water and um, water we can have enough we can have too much or not enough so drought and floods um, are a big event and it's not um, if um, we look on pakistan we had some years ago um, a flooding covering one third of the country for several months um, and so that type of um, events um, can happen um, with big damages. And the biggest natural catastrophe we had last year was flooding in uh, China. Biological risks, we have uh, um, all the things like uh, low costs of fungi or bacteria, not only affecting our animals, which we need and uh, for eating or nutrition, uh, but also for plants and uh, having uh, um, low costs uh, 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago in the Bible, suddenly they are there in East Africa again, uh, causing uh, uh, famines and so on. The next uh, category of risks are biometric risks. So we are used to accidental disability care uh, parts. Epidemics, which are just written one word in health and epidemics, turned out uh, last year to be a huge risk. I will come to that in some detail. But we have also um, risks on the demographic side, like low fertility, like longevity. Longevity does not seem to be a risk that you live too long. Um, but if you do not have the financial means in old age to uh, be old and to have a life and dignity and to pay, uh, to have enough uh, funds for paying um, health uh, care bills, then that is a risk as well. Then on the economic side, um, we uh, all know that uh, poverty on a single basis, but also on a country basis, may be a, a big concern and uh, um, that can change the fate not only of a family or of a city, but of a whole country. Uh, resource scarcity, we have uh, food and water, but also rare minerals or other uh, resources where we have not enough or which are not distrib distributed in a way that we have uh, um, easy access to that. Um, recession uh, and default, default of companies, but also of countries or of single families are other risks. I will go into some details on the financial crisis. Then um, we have risks coming from the fact that we live together and work together in towns and companies. And uh, then we have uh, property risks like fire, we have liability risks, but we have also new technologies, new technologies in the digital area, but also in nanotechnology or medical um, technologies, which might cause new risk. Then I, environmental change, um, especially climate change, but there are more environmental changes uh, on the way that we do as civilizations, we cause it and then it will have effects back on the natural risk side with hurricanes or, uh, and so on. And then we have the bad guys, crime, terror, and war. And uh, um, in the end, we have risks covering all these categories are, or are beyond those categories, like risk governance, like politics and regulations, uh, or reputation. And we have seen on the highest uh, political uh, positions in the world that uh, there might be risks as well. With that overview, um, I will um, just uh, show us a few details. So on uh, natural risks uh, last year, we had $210 billion losses globally. And thereof more than a third, 82 billion were insured. Um, and the most severe events were uh, the floods in China, I mentioned already, hurricanes in the North Atlantic and US wildfires. If you look on hurricanes, uh, on the bottom, uh, there are two hurricanes mentioned, uh, Katrina in New Orleans and Sandy, which went up to New York and flooded it. And uh, we had uh, huge losses within a few days. 
And even though we know about hurricanes, that they can come and that they have a huge power to destroy things, uh, we are not always well prepared for that, as you can see on those sources. And if I go back, climate change um, is a um, effect and it's a development where uh, thanks to COVID-19, we had uh, a little break last year in the past, but nevertheless, um, it seems very unlikely from all the data we have up to now that we really can uh, limit the temperature increase, the global temperature uh, uh, degrees to two degrees uh, centigrade. So um, that is uh, like the politicians around the world now say as well, um, one of the real challenges and we do not need to forget that, forget that after um, we fight this pandemics. Okay, then, um, if we um, look on um, the biometric risks, and let's start with COVID-19, and these are on a logarithmic scale, the people infected um, at the 20th of each month last year, uh, as the World Health Organization provided the data. And you can see um, the trend, which seems to be linear from April to December. Um, but since we have this exponential um, scale, that is an, uh, still an exponential um, development. And um, if we uh, see that it took only a few weeks from uh, end of December last year up to March when we uh, declared the pandemics and we knew that we are going to 1 million infected people, but that it uh, go, went out of control. And um, now we are fighting not only with the mutations, but also to have vaccination in place very fast. But uh, all we can see is that that will continue for uh, some months to come. Now, if we look back on 2020 on uh, that risk type, we had um, um, the um, 83 million uh, cases, uh, most of them US, India, Brazil, and also the deaths. We had a public lockdown uh, on all of the different types of um, um, ways of life, um, but at different times, uh, in different locations, with different duration, so and with different types of supervision. So um, whether that was always uh, good and effective is an open question. The same is uh, true with the companies. Many had to um, run down their business and, and to close it, but they got help from all the governments around the world. But if we add up the help of governments, then we have uh, around $7 trillion. Um, so uh, 7,000 billion, uh, um, which is a very huge amount, much more than in the financial crisis. And the question of course is, who will pay it back? It will be us, but how will we pay it back? Is it taxes? Will it be inflation? Will it be the next generation? Um, so how do we handle that? We have to cope with that question in half a year when we have uh, COVID-19 behind us. Um, already in June last year, we made a, um, a little study how the new normal of the world would look like after COVID-19 in three to five years. I won't go through that right now, but uh, um, you can see that uh, um, the question is open whether we just uh, start again or whether we will uh, start in a changed world. And obviously that will be the case. Another biometric risk is demography. This is the world population, um, the last 50 years and the next 50 years. And it will go up to more than 10 uh, billion uh, people, regardless of COVID-19, that will have a small impact on the, on the large scale, global scale in 50 years time. If you see the light uh, blue bars at the bottom, um, that are the children up to 14 years, that is constant right now. That does not grow anymore. So the world population is only growing because we uh, don't die early, but we live very long. And if you take the red ones, 80 and above, that will be up to 640 million people in uh, 50 years time. So what do we do with that? 
or what do we do with you because you will be one of those people uh, being in that age group. We have to uh, restructure all our infrastructure uh, in terms of living, in terms of care, in terms of health, in terms of old age financing, um, and uh, that will be around the globe. There's another impact of demographic uh, change, and that is that the um, countries and their impact uh, will um, change over time. So 50 years ago, we had uh, countries like Germany and Korea, like uh, France and uh, Japan being important big countries, and we uh, lose population because all these countries have very low fertility rates, so not enough babies per uh, woman uh, to sustain the uh, development. And if we look uh, 50 years ahead, those are uh, UN statistical uh, scenarios, and then um, India will overtake China, Nigeria will overtake the US, and nobody speaks any longer from France or Germany or Korea or Japan because we are no longer on that list. Another, and um, going to economic risk, um, labor is one uh, thing I, uh, which is underestimated sometimes. And there was a famous study from Frey Osborne, um, now already eight years ago, where they uh, estimated that 40% of global jobs will disappear. Well, they did it first for the US, but um, that it's, um, 40% of uh, jobs in advanced countries will disappear, 30% will change significantly, and only 30% will remain. And then we have to see, we have more home offices, we have new professions, we have older populations. So uh, how does that change our world? And uh, um, the, question, the answer is uh, that we and you will not remain where you are in terms of skills, but that you have to change your skill set, not once in a life at university or after university, but every five years again, or maybe even more often. And this is a map for financial services, um, where a few years ago we looked on how um, managers in financial services need to uh, change their um, their learning and their way to uh, work in um, financial services. And it's not only about the digital world, but it's about explaining it, explaining the digital world. Why does a computer send such a bad letter to an 80 year old lady? And then she calls and you are sitting there and you must not only explain to the lady why she needs to pay more premium, but also why the computer was right and she's loving to do so. So not an easy task, up to understanding artificial intelligence and still remaining uh, creative. Another uh, topic on economic risk is the big financial crisis from 2007 that lasts uh, until 2013, but uh, 2007, 2008 were the big events. And it uh, started with a housing crisis in the US and uh, then there were downgrades in um, uh, several uh, uh, securities and uh, it spread it from the US all over uh, the world. We had um, bank runs like Northern Rock Building Society in the United Kingdom, but it came also to the Euro, Rome, uh, Euro uh, area uh, as well. And I would like to take a minute to take one thing out here in the number six, B. Stearns, and just to um, show you in detail how that happens um, if we have a financial crisis. So in early March 2008, we had B.S. Stearns, one of the biggest global brokers in financial markets, 85 years old, $400 billion balance sheet. And their, uh, their job was to uh, take short-term funding, short-term money from other banks, and then to invest it in long-term projects and to get a profit out of the interest rate uh, difference. They had low ethical um, reputation and had some problems um, with uh, hedge funds where they uh, were invested, but outside the balance sheet and uh, small um, white rounds in the last quarters before. 
And then they changed in the beginning of 2008 their CEO, their chief executive officer. And uh, um, uh, in early March, there were some rumors that there are problems in another hedge fund where $1.7 billion were invested, so not very big in terms of the balance sheet, but there was no uh, concise um, um, uh, communication from Bear Stearns. <clears throat> now, on March 10th, 2008, a Monday, they had in the morning $18.1 billion liquidity, cash on hands, cash in their accounts. So it was a very cash-rich company. And they exceeded all the risk capital criteria called bail two for banks. So they had a strong balance sheet as well. And then that day, there, were, there was a downgrading of mortgage-backed securities issued by that bank, by a rating agency, and some rumors which were wrong about liquidity problems at Bear Stearns. You could see that they, had, that they had 18 billion liquidity, so there were no liquidity problems. Then they asked uh, the chairman, the, uh, the CEO, um, who was in Florida that time playing golf, um, to come back to New York and to tell the press that they won't have problems. And then the CEO said, I will not come because then the people will think we have a problem. So he uh, played in golf another day. But on Tuesday, all the other banks, they did not prolong their money. They withdraw their money. And although they tried to sell something, the, uh, the liquidity funds went down. And uh, on Wednesday, um, the CEO came back and said in the television, um, balance sheet not weakened at all. Well, but now liquidity became a problem, not the balance sheet. And uh, the hedge fund with the rumors uh, that collapsed and uh, then they sold whatever they could. Also on Thursday, when they started Thursday, they still had 3 billion of uh, liquidity, but uh, going down by 1 billion every hour. And at the end of the fourth day, they had to give up. They called for help and then they went bankrupt and the Federal Reserve went in and GP Morgan, a strong bank at that time. And also today they uh, saved that. So a huge 85 year old bank with $18 billion on cash could be destroyed in four days. So just remember that. Now going to civilization risk, and we had many of those events in the financial crisis. So civilization risks, um, there, there are cyber and uh, big data risks. You all know uh, them very well. I will um, address artificial intelligence in a moment, but uh, be aware that we have a lot of new technologies which may cause risks. If we have nano surface coating, nanoparticles and uh, in some cream for your skin and suddenly uh, you might have problems there. So we have to make sure um, that we understand new technologies. The same is true with autonomous uh, cars and vehicles which will come. Artificial intelligence is uh, spreading much faster than we uh, see it right now. Um, for the time being in military and technology, it's still the human who makes the final push on the button. So it's still uh, we humans uh, that we uh, decide, but it is uh, already possible, technically possible, to um, create artificial intelligence cells which um, are acting without human um, interference. And uh, sometimes that might be good, um, but sometimes that might be risky. And we are far away from any governance to protect humans or for, to register artificial intelligence or to uh, see uh, where in the military area or the news area, we might uh, um, have artificial intelligence inside, not only as an opportunity, which clearly it is, but also, also as a risk. Now, if, um, as if we leave those four categories and we look uh, on uh, overall um, risk uh, things, this is a, the example of supply chain uh, disruptions. If you look at the, uh, the supply for a factory from all over the world can be interrupted for several reasons. And these reasons are everywhere in all the different parts of the risk map. 
So um, to be aware um, of your risks uh, is always a very broad uh, item. Um, also in so in these questions like supply chain. There are some meta risks and let me uh, just take the example of governance. What is governance? Wherever people live and work together, a common framework of values, rules and procedures enables their success. And that is true for governments uh, and for companies, but also on smaller entities wherever you look at. So this type of corporate governance uh, was important and still is important, but we also need it for societal, for political uh, systems and for um, cyber systems as well. So governance is a meta risk which becomes more and more important um, because it's no longer as clear how to steer um, very complex risks otherwise. And uh, uh, here is the... Um, Last one, answering the question about uh, black swans and uh, gray uh, rhinos. Um, so there are five uh, examples of huge events where we knew the primary cause. So Sandy was a hurricane, we knew about that. And uh, the same is true with longevity or COVID-19, that there are new viruses coming up um, uh, that we knew. Then uh, the immediate effect, um, is normally also known. So if we have a new uh, virus that we can get to a global pandemics um, that we have known. And there have been enough um, um, models really to say how a global pandemic will develop. Those uh, first models were 50 years old already. And uh, um, so that was not really a surprise. And we had pandemic plans in most of the countries. And the same is true with uh, hurricanes and that there are storms and flooding, that's this we know. Now the question about mm, which harm can, can make a, a Reno or uh, what does really mean to have a black swan is that we have secondary effects, distant effects, which are unknown in terms of probability or impact. So that the Hurricane Sandy really flooded the New York underground and the power plants in New York so that there is no transport and no electricity in some parts of New York for even two weeks, nobody has uh, imagined before. So that is something which was new. Or uh, that volcanoes in Iceland can erupt and then we have ash clouds over Europe and then the aircrafts cannot uh, come from Bangkok to Munich with spare parts for BMW car production. So that a car factory needs to cl close down because the supply chain was not working anymore. Nobody knew before. So that was a new uh, um, effect for learning. And the same was true, of course, in the financial crisis and in the Corona crisis where we had uh, a lot to learn. So with that, I um, will uh, close. And I think uh, if there are some very immediate um, uh, questions um, about this risk fan, then you can ask uh, it now. Or otherwise, we see the specific uh, um, Korean case and we can discuss it uh, together. So I hand back to Felix. Then I also don't want to hold this and then we can directly proceed with the presentation from Professor Selinger. And he was the second person to whom we didn't hand over during the introductory session. So I also prepared an introduction for you. So um, we're happy to have you here as the uh, resident representative of the Hans Seidel Stiftung, Hans Seidel Foundation in the Republic of Korea. Um, you are also a member of the German Korean Forum and you have for a long time been involved in projects towards the Korean unification and therefore gained broad expertise also on, on North Korea. You received uh, two honorary citizenships, one from the Gangwon province and one from the city of Seoul. And we are very much looking forward to your presentation to RIS from a Korean perspective. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and I hope you can all understand me. Hello to everybody, old friends and, and all participants. Um, actually, when we uh, planned this event, uh, it was not so clear what we would do, how we would uh, share our presentations, but I think it turned out to be quite good in that sense that we now have one general introduction to risk globally and that I try 
to make an illustration of that to the Korean case. Now, uh, since uh, we were not really um, clear from the beginning who would participate, for some of you, this might be very general. Uh, for others, it might be new things. So I hope I have for everybody a little bit insight here. And uh, just let me say, for those who don't know the system of German political foundations, we are acting worldwide uh, for um, the German development policy, though we are NGO actors. And here you see uh, the countries our foundation is active in, and uh, Korea is really a very special case because we are mostly in transformation countries or in uh, developing countries. We have the pleasure here to live in a very advanced country, but still with uh, South and North Korea have uh, yeah, very critical relations in Northeast Asia where we uh, have our work done. And what I want to do today is a little bit to talk about risk in Korea and how to deal with it. Uh, look at country risk, especially that is North Korea and the nuclear crisis, natural disasters, uh, then I want to look uh, on the new disaster risk management strategy of North Korea, which was um, decided in 2019 and is not so well known yet. Look at uh, one or two particular disasters in South Korea and how they impacted uh, the societal attitude towards risk. Some conclusions are following. Um, first of all, now, what do you see here? I don't know if he, if I move my cursor, you can you see that? So who knows this disaster? I guess our Koreans will know that. No, it's a Sampung department store collapsing 1995. Then uh, this one, what was the IMF? It was, it's the Korean name for the uh, East Asian crisis. It's called there the IMF crisis. And it was certainly a disaster for many uh, yeah, people getting unemployed, for example. That one, one of the many, how many bridges do we have in Seoul now? I think 25. And in the past, there was always this song by the Seoul brothers, a German group saying, song to bridge, field Stück. There's a piece missing. That was another disaster, 1995. Here we have the Sevolo disaster, I talk later a little bit about. What, what's this one? Any idea? That's a shelling of Yompyong, uh, where only two people died, but it's an artillery attack in very, very recent times. This one, most of you might not know. It's a um, forest fire two years ago in Kosong. It's the inner Korean border, where also two people died. Uh, many houses were destroyed. And finally, we have here a picture of not of the uh, COVID-19, but of the mass, si uh, mass time when we had the disinfection of um, public places like subways. So this gives you some idea how uh, many kinds of various risks we have to deal with. And you can then put it very well together with uh, what Professor DeVille said about the different uh, kinds of biometric risk, political risk, et cetera, et cetera. And how do Koreans deal with that? principally clearly like other countries do. We have large risk conferences. There's actually uh, one event every year more or less that's uh, called Risk Korea. That is looking at uh, economic risk and sovereign risk especially, so financial markets and risk. We have uh, disaster risk management. There's a rather new book in Springer um, on disaster risk management. We have uh, institutions who deal with the political risk. There's a, a Korea Risk Group, which is um, uh, which is publishing an um, online outlet, which most of you probably know, uh, called NK News. So that's behind the NK News. And they do also conferences on political risk. In the um, past year, almost every day in the news, KCDC, which is um, same like, what's it called in Germany, Drosten. Uh, so uh, that is an institution which is um, caring for uh, coping with COVID. And I have to say, just by the numbers, they care, uh, care very well. Actually, I don't talk so much about COVID because I, I feared everybody would talk about it uh, here. So, but I will make some remarks maybe. Anyway, today, another day with uh, 400 
uh, infections only by for 50 million people. Finally, we can also study risk in Korea, but not in very many places, actually. But in Yonsei University, there's a course on disaster risk management and Korean policies. There might be other ones, but it's not really a widespread and popular thing to study risk alone. Maybe it's simply too specialized, or maybe they studied, um, I checked it mainly, I think, in an English language database. So there might be Korean courses on this. So Korea has a network or has, has, has different uh, ways to cope with the risk. And I will later talk a little more about that. Now, if you look at the country risk, usually we have three types. It's the sovereign risk, where I don't look so much at. That means financial risk. And we have economic and political risks. And we have a lot of institutions uh, like Fitch or Moody's, um, Global Edge, who prepare risk assessments and also give out these um, uh, risk ratings and they are for clearly in for example in the field of finance they are very very important because they decide prices for example uh, for uh, certain uh, goods or um, premiums you have to pay over benchmarks etc mm, if you look at the risk now particularly let's look at uh, the one risk everybody knows about that's uh, nuclear weapons uh, and this risk now can influence also markets clearly, but to what extent? There have been quite a few studies and it's quite interesting to see. First of all, we really uh, don't know. We have statements which uh, seem to mean uh, that the Korean Peninsula is bordering on war. And I remember I've been here now for 22 years and I remember at least four times where I know that German families were sent home or went home, families of teachers in German school, sometimes families of embassy people even, who went home because they thought the situation in the Korean Peninsula is so hot that it might actually explode. One was 2016, this famous uh, Twitter uh, fight between uh, uh, Trump, then incoming Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un. But before there were also times like that. And at least one colleague of mine from one foundation said, uh, I, I never thought of war, but now I expect it a few years ago. So it's a risk which seems to be quite prevailing. We don't know how we can really evaluate this risk. Is there a Korean risk premium? As I said, uh, there were <clears throat> uh, studies done on that. And here's, for example, you see a um, period from 2006 when we had the first nuclear bomb to 2007. And you see uh, that when the bomb exploded, for example, there were, was quite a great uh, volatility on the uh, COSPI index, which is the Korean Stock Exchange Index, and also on the um, uh, Korea, uh, the one dollar exchange rate, in that sense that usually you got more one for the dollar when some certain um, event happened. But surprisingly, Koreans got quite used to it. And I have here a list, I'm sure you cannot read that, but one line is really important. And that's the lower line here, the average on North Korean provocations. So here they ordered all provocations. The battles of Yongpyong, which were naval battles, nuclear tests, um, some the breakdown of the six parties in 2008, six party talks, sanctions on North Korea, um, the death of Kim Jong-il, etc. And you find overall the average on the Kospi performance, so on the share market, is zero in one day, and there's no negative uh, impact uh, in the long run, on the contrary. Other factors uh, are more important, so basically that North Korean provocations have no impact. So is there no risk? That's the question now. Is, there, is this all just words? North Koreans are famous to say what we say we do. There's actually a very famous song in North Korea about that, and there are posters on that. And usually they have this poster of a soldier crushing the Capitol Hill in, in uh, Washington or um, crushing the Blue House, but they don't, didn't do it yet. Does it mean they will never do it? Mm, basically, we can say there is a technical possibility that we have very severe risk. And here you see certain 
um, um, rockets, missiles of North Korea and which uh, reach they have. And you can say with the newest missile, if it works and if it were properly started and um, would properly uh, re-enter, that is uh, uh, the nuclear payload, they could reach practically everywhere in the US and even in Europe if they want. But do they want to do so? There's at least one man who says we shouldn't discard uh, that possibility. That's a man who is uh, down here. It's a famous defector. It's Tae Yong Ho, who is now in the um, Korean, uh, in, in the uh, South Korean Parliament, National Assembly, and he was a, a vice ambassador of North Korea in the United Kingdom. And he maintains that North Korea, they don't maybe want to attack the US, but they certainly want to use their um, missile arsenal for um, extortion of South Korea, basically to subdue South Korea. And uh, one thing they want to do, he says, and, and that was actually in a way uh, confirmed by the last uh, uh, party congress uh, two, two, a week ago, that they want also to develop tactical nuclear weapons now, which they could easier use on the Korean Peninsula maybe or use at least as a, a threat of force. The problem is we don't know. We don't even know if Kim Jong-un is dead or alive. And this was an episode from last uh, year where he disappeared and really nobody knew. Did he have a heart attack? Did he have a quarantine period? Did he just enjoy his holiday? We don't know a lot about North Korea. So how can we assess this risk? And you talked about black swans. I don't know. I'm an economist and we learned, uh, I mean, everything which is written today has been written probably a hundred years ago already. And uh, there was a famous, uh, I think, social scientist or economist at Chicago University, Frank Knight, who talked about this difference of risk versus uncertainty. And he said, basically for risk, you can have numbers. You can say it's a risk of uh, 20%, 30%, 40%, uh, but for uncertainty, you don't have really. This is, is one of, I think, of the founding assets of actually uh, risk management studies. And the problem is a little bit then with strategic patients. So if you just say, well, there probably won't be a risk, the less we react or the more we ignore the risk, the more North Korea needs to escalate tension to be taken serious. That's also what this New Yorker um, uh, cover basically says. It's like a, a small baby which is crying and nobody listens doesn't necessarily stop to cry. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that they use their uh, bombs, but they have some for a certain reason. So how should we react to this again? And uh, one way the South Koreans cope with this risk is to spend a lot of money for these hypothetical risks. And the most uh, um, impressive uh, building they built to do so is this building, it's the so-called Peace Dam. It's a dam which the South Korean built in the middle of nowhere in the mountains of uh, Inje or Wachon maybe, or Yanggu, so in the, in the northern border area, because of the following thing. I hope you can see this. Here you have a map and you see in the northern part, there is a dam built. It's the so-called Imnam Dam. And that dam was built by the North Koreans to uh, change the flow of water, which originally flew to South Korea, so that it's now going down to North Korea. They use it for electricity uh, production, maybe. But when they built this dam, there was a great suspicion in South Korea that one day in a war, the North Koreans could simply open that dam, and then all the water would flow down again to where we have now on the southern part, you have these uh, circles with Beckham Sun, then we have Pyongwai Dam, that the, the Peace Dam, and then Wachon Dam, and this flows into the uh, basically the lakes uh, surrounding so uh, Chuncheon and from there to Seoul. So we would have huge flooding, possible potential flooding through these. And to prevent this flooding, we have this Peace Dam built, which is a dam not to store water, but to prevent uh, flooding in times of war by North Korea. So well, that's a way to cope with this risk. In other ways, I would say the South Koreans completely black out the, the war risk. Uh, we see it not only in the stock exchange, but also in the life of Koreans. For the South Koreans, the Korean War is an episode of history. It's very different in North Korea 
where the Korean War is an ongoing war, where people live on a war footing by constant propaganda, by constant uh, exercises and practices. I, I live now 22 years in Seoul and we have not even once a year, we have these civilian protection um, uh, exercises, which were so frequent in the past. So it's really a thing which we simply don't take serious as risk. Now let's come to other risk, uh, natural disasters, forest fire, flooding, droughts and typhoons, geological uh, risks, uh, communicable diseases uh, for humans and for animals. Mm, here I want to say just one or two things. One thing, I think these risks are largely mastered by the South Koreans. South Koreans are fabulous in technological development and they had some events where they paid uh, a lot, like uh, as I said before, these technical disasters like the Sampum department store, the Songso Bridge, etc. And they introduced by now very, very good technical solu technological solutions to cope with this risk. Seismic, mis seismic risk is anyway very low in, North, in, South, in, in Korea compared to Japan, let's say. But we do have it, and we had last year a larger outbreak of a uh, earthquake. But you see here the seismic observation network, which is very, very complete. The same is true, for example, for uh, the tsunami risk. After the Fukushima uh, incident, South Korea installed everywhere these um, uh, rallying points where you could go in the uh, case of tsunami. And clearly, the water management is working also very well. And uh, everybody who has a chance, I really uh, would ask you to go once to Taejeon. There's K Water, which is the largest water provider in um, Korea. And it's really like in a, in a, a James Bond movie, they have a huge uh, meeting room and then suddenly some blinds are opening and you look down into this control room where they control, I think, seven or 8,000 dams. And uh, basically uh, now there are not five or six people sitting, but only one person who really can completely with one uh, touch of the screen control all these um, uh, water uh, levels and uh, how much water is released by dams. That's already a, really a technical wonder. That does not mean that they completely master these risks, but they are very good in doing so. And risk management, and I'll say later a little bit why, became very important for them. Uh, we have uh, urban risk management also. I won't tell too much for that. Again, flooding. We have subway fires, terrible ones like in Taejeon. But everything is um, really um, uh, studied quite well. And the uh, South Koreans try to find an answer to that. And you have here a number of disaster types, uh, which... Uh, uh, were uh, put together with a um, methodology which comes from the United Nations, from this new uh, disaster risk uh, facility of the United Nations, the QRE uh, risk, and this here you see a table for Seoul. So they are uh, dealing with these disasters and pre principally, I think, very well. Uh, they are biological uh, risks like the outbreak of the African swine fever, here they do not so well, I think. There's avian influenza, this highly um, deadly strain every year. And uh, I would say it's sometimes related to political facts. Here you see where the swine fever comes from. It's clear it comes from North Korea. Uh, in the case of avian influenza, the South Koreans spent a lot of money uh, in uh, clearing wetlands from the remaining few insects they have, but they don't want to touch the real source of it, which is the mass um, uh, livestock production, uh, which uh, always brings about new cases of this. But uh, also they do a lot of research on, on that. And we were involved in this um, case of swine fever in a, a, one of the rare North South Korean events two years ago. Uh, which was really difficult to organize, but which helped the South Koreans a little bit better to understand um, where the problems with fighting swine fever in North, North Korea were. we we'll go over this. And I want now say a few words on North Korea. The risks are the same, but the impact is much, much uh, better, worse than in uh, uh, South Korea. We have too much water. That is a picture of... Uh, 
uh, which I took myself in, in Rason in 2015. Uh, we have too few water. We have every year in one province droughts. Um, we have forest fires. This is a picture of 2011. It's a satellite image and you see here everywhere where you have the uh, smokes. This is all uh, large forest fires in the North Korean parts. And we have uh, long and cold freezing winters. And I have to say, for South Korea, for North Koreans to talk about climate change, they like to do so because they blame their disasters on it. They say we have flooding and we have droughts because of climate change. Personally, I'm quite skeptical on that because a lot of what you see is man-made because deforestation, which made that uh, half of their forest disappeared, uh, is an immediate reason for a lot of flooding, which is not related to climate change in a larger picture. And uh, the same is true for the droughts because they have problems with the water balance in their own country. And generally, clearly, the cold and freezing conditions like now are much, much worse for the North Koreans than uh, the heat in the summer because here people die every uh, every day and we have it uh, the news to, uh, again now that if you go around certain railway stations in the northern part of the country you see every day frozen people there especially children these uh, could be beggar children who don't find enough food so that's certainly a, um, a hazard they have and it's related to the nutritional situation so disasters in North Korea were a lot in the headlines and we have to say it's uh, very fortunate that in the last years North Korea was more uh, willing to talk with the international community about that. That had also a political reason because uh, not much else was possible. There was no more trade possible. There was no more uh, cultural exchange possible. There was no more um, development aid possible. So one of the few things the international community and North Korea could agree upon was looking at disaster, but that was maybe a good thing to do. So a lot of trainings took place and then uh, North Korea became more uh, responsive to disasters. And here you see pictures from uh, state TV, uh, Chosan TV, uh, where people are sent out uh, from Pyongyang to help uh, flooded regions this uh, summer. So the floods come every summer and uh, here the people were sent out and it was the first time that it was so uh, intensely in the media, which I, though it was certainly a propaganda event, it's good that it was a propaganda event with such a content because it's very important. And North Korea adopted in late 2019 a disaster risk reduction strategy uh, after preparation with uh, European NGOs, with the Swiss Development Corporation, UN organizations. We worked with them, for example, on watershed management, etc. And as I said, was a kind of least common uh, denominator. But this strategy is really very well written. Here's something on the contents. I won't go into too much, maybe just one thing. It's following closely guidelines of the um, uh, United Nations, and it has three action plans, which are very, very detailed, uh, giving uh, goals and deadlines on what to do. I um, don't know, I have it somewhere here. Yes, for example, the action plan until uh, 2022, which uh, writes exactly down who has to do something. There's a committee on this, SCEDM. Uh, which is important, and there's cooperative agencies like ministries, like the Ministry of Environment, uh, counties, etc. So they do that very well, and um, they have certain uh, objectives, um, which include raising national awareness, developing science and technology, capacity building, and here then international cooperation comes in uh, to have an emergency response system, etc. Now. This is a strategy and uh, how well is it implemented? That's a very, very different thing. Like so often the strategy is there, but the implementation clearly lacks. And we saw it this year when we had the big flooding. But the point which is for us very relevant also is that we have a very strong emphasis on international cooperation in this strategy. 
I come to my next point, and that is uh, the impact of the Seville disaster. I find that very, very important because I think that afterwards uh, the attitude towards risk changed a lot in uh, South Korea. And just to uh, recall for those who might not have it in mind, we had 2014, the sinking of the Seville, a ferry on route to, from Incheon to Jeju. And we had 304 people dying. Among them, 2,500, uh, 250, sorry, high school uh, students from one high school in Ansan. And that was the real national catastrophe. If you know uh, the attitude of Koreans towards their children, we have on average one child or less per family. So if you think, uh, when uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, how many children did he have? 17, I think. And when one or two of them died, it was a normal event. It was certainly mourned, but it was an event of life. But if your only child dies without a chance to get a new one, sorry, these were high school students, basically the families are then over getting a new one, it's a catastrophe for that family. And it became a national catastrophe, together with the fact that the dead of them seemed to be very, very senseless because basically the captain or the, the crew ordered them to stay in their cabins and they drowned in their cabins while they could have been saved if they had gone up and uh, left the um, ferry. So it was a huge national outcry and became a very, very political and politicized event. Uh, actually, it was, in my opinion, the single most important contributive factor to the fall of Park Geun-hye. You see here how her approval rate fell, and it was really that she had quite a good approval rate before, and she never really recovered uh, from that one. We had seven parliamentary inquiries because many people thought there was uh, something hidden, because this event was so hideous, they said there must be some conspiracy behind it. And um, four year long, there were protests. It was this Yellow Ribbon campaign. There were two movies made about it. So it became really a major event. Uh, two days ago, the result of this uh, event came out, nothing. So all the conspiracy theories basically were debunked. There was no conspiracy about it. There was a bungled response by the Coast Guard, certainly. Uh, there was a criminal behavior by the crew and criminal behavior by the owner of the Seville, but it was not really a political disaster, if you want so, but it was human disaster. And, uh, but the truth came only out uh, after it didn't help uh, them anymore who were accused of that, namely, you see here, January 19th. And it changed really, in my opinion, directly the attitude of Koreans towards risk. So uh, we should see that we had it in conjunction with another um, episode that was a mass outbreak, which cost 38 lives. Now we would laugh about it, but in, I mean, compared to COVID, we would, we would think it's a minor event, but it was also creating anxiety in the Korean uh, peninsula. And from that time on, we had much more, um, for example, focus on respiratory issues, fine dust issues. And I have to say, I because I'm also married to a Korean and have two kids here, I was always laughing at that. And I uh, uh, refused to wear masks for this little bit amounts of fine dust, but uh, it helped certainly the Korean tremendously in the current crisis. That was one of the reasons why they came so well through the crisis. They were extremely disciplined and they knew what problems could come if you are not disciplined. So um, these two events together really made a different attitude towards these risks. So we have rather comprehensive disaster management plans. Um, there is a and that was then a major factor, acceptance of hygienic uh, standards, wearing masks, also tracing and tracking. Uh, it's really the dis debates uh, which are in Europe about how we can follow up on COVID are completely ununderstandable from a Korean point of view. When you came last June to Germany, it could happen in an airplane that there was nobody asking you even where you came from or to do anything regarding COVID impossible to think like that in, in South Korea. And uh, then uh, also this so-called Corona app, which you have in, in Germany, it's, yeah, it's a joke compared with the way the Koreans do the tracking, namely simply by logging into the telecom uh, uh, data and taking all the data they need and they are very successful with it. Uh, 
Nevertheless, there are other areas where the preparation is lacking. Cannot really explain it. Maybe here's somebody, I, th I think we have one of the health sector, you can do that because South Korea has very, very few cases of really intensive care need, but still they are worrying all the time that the intensive care beds are not enough, though they use much less than we have in Germany. I'm not sure if they have so few, uh, but that there are some area where it's not so good, uh, the response. And also clearly uh, mid of last year when they had the chance to early contract some uh, vaccines, they made a major blunder. They basically said, well, we have no cases. We wait and see what happens. So today they are now crawling to get still some vaccines. And they said maybe the first arrive in February here. Finally, a little bit, if I have still time, talk about uh, political and uh, economic uncertainty and risk. There are so many, and some were mentioned. I was I want just really uh, fastly to go through this. We have household debt. It's a major economic risk, risk we have in Korea. Youth unemployment, the housing bubble, demographic risk related to that. We have uh, political risk, instability, and uh, the abuse, as I would call it, of the justice system, we see uh, in every um, administration or in every government, we see that the justice system is used to direct or, or to correct policies instead of doing a political debate. And we see that also in relation to Japan, we have an expropriation risk. Japanese companies have been expropriated uh, in uh, regard with um, forced labor, though uh, the Japanese point of view is that all this has been cleared with 1965 um, diplomatic exchange. And uh, even the South Korean government hoped that the uh, justice system would not go on to really expropriate companies, but it happened here. Uh, and that is last remark, it's maybe not scientific, it's just an observation. I find there's this over, still surprisingly optimistic uh, overall economic behavior. If you see how the Koreans found new company, how they adapt to new technologies, that's something where uh, risk seems to play no role at all. And certainly it helps them to overcome some of the problems which we see in other countries, like in our country, in Germany. There is political risk, there's also a risk for politicians. I want to mention that, and it's related to the justice system. It is not normal, I think, that in a country, uh, I think four of the, three of the um, presidents, last presidents, uh, if you include uh, Chundo one, are jailed. Uh, you had one suicide, you had a suicide of uh, a mayor of Seoul, you have the mayor of, uh, former mayor of Busan indicted. Uh, so there's a, very, very difficult relation of uh, justice and politics in this country. And this is a risk for um, uh, politicians, but also a risk for doing business here, for example. Where if you think of the Volkswagen scandal, which is certainly a, a problematic scandal, but basically um, German employees of Volkswagen were fleeing out of this country because they feared political um, reprisal after the um, uh, scandal came out here. So we have really some problems in, in the political sector in relation to the economy and to the society also. Finally, okay, in recent years, disaster risk management became one of the focus tasks of the UN system. And the former UNISTA, it's now called United Nation Disaster Risk Reduction Unit or something. And I think it's a good um, global uh, development that this is related to resilience and sustainability. So we have the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, where we have these both sides of the medal together, sustainability, resilience on the one hand, and re uh, reduction of disaster risk. I think in that area, Korea, uh, Republic of Korea has made great advances towards more risk management. In other areas, like in the political area, it uh, might still lag behind. So that was a tour de force uh, over various risks, and I hope we can then come to more discussion on that. Thank you very much. This was really great, very insightful. Maybe we can take the chance before we go to the discussion 
to answer some immediate questions. Absolutely. Are there any questions as of now? Yeah, Lisa? Um, yeah, I actually have a question that maybe goes to both speakers. Um, I was asking myself on how to, I know it's, it relies on statistic measurements, but um, on how to choose criteria to actually really measure risk, uh, because as pointed out that risk is something different than uncertainty, so it's measurable, but so there must be criteria on how it can be measured. So what would that actually be? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, maybe I, uh, I start with, with that. Um, that is a very important question without an answer. Uh, if we take a financial risk alone, then for financial risk, we have several risk measures like volatility of prices, uh, uh, like value at risk for uh, certain positions in financial markets. Um, but uh, already a decade before the financial crisis, there were empirical studies saying that uh, those risk measures are not really a good predictor of what will happen and what can happen. Um, and if we are already in the financial area alone, um, we need several risk measures to have some idea what might happen, then it's even worse um, if we take all economic risk or all risks um, to have some measures. So, so far, um, we have not come up um, with any type of um, uh, of real concrete measure. I mean, politicians sometimes tend to ask how many billion euros are at stake or how many people can die or can I lose the next election? So there, those are some type of question, but it, it is um, the risk areas are too complex really to find to one or two or three um, numbers. So if you um, are heading for a Nobel Prize, then uh, <laughs> it's an easy task to find them. Maybe I can uh, add some words uh, to a short step at my colleague here. I'm a little skeptical, especially on long-term predictions. We had so many of them. Think of the Club of Rome who are really wrong. But that does not mean that the predictions are useless. And that's the same if you think of climate change risks or so. We need these predictions, but we should be very, very, uh, also demographic risks. But we are really, uh, should be very, very modest and uh, use them with full of humility because we don't know what the future brings really. Having said that, we can also miss, uh, measure risk attitudes. That's a little easier. I mean, you can, uh, and that's, I think, also a very important point. You can ask people simply how they evaluate various risks. And you see, for example, if you think of uh, nuclear power in, in Germany, it's a big topic. But if I look here in Korea, uh, we had a phase when there was no um, uh, risk attitude or, or no heightened risk uh, consciousness in South Korea about the nuclear uh, power. Then, uh, with the um, Fukushima incident, it became more and more, but still we had the plans to massively increase nuclear power. Then a government came into power, this current government, who said, okay, we have to cut down the power plants. But by that time, the people again had a different attitude. And basically then they had to falsify reports uh, on uh, one power plant which they wanted to cut down, which is now another major political scandal here because uh, the, the people basically said, we want this power plant to be there. It's cheap energy and it's clean energy and we need it. So it's uh, you can ask the people. That is something you should definitely do, but that doesn't give you the exact measurement of the risk, but gives you some idea how prevalent it is as a societal problem. I mean, if you think of the risk like suicide also, which are also very, very revealing for these, you find probably certain numbers at least. And uh, as we know in Germany, I think it's the same, but here in the COVID crisis, again, suicide rates, which were very high, went massively up again, especially among uh, st uh, middle and high school students, which is very sad. 
I think we just transitioned to our discussion period, which is great because that would also have been the next point on the agenda. My proposal would be if you raise your hand, I will take note of this. Jan, I already saw you. And then I will just call you in the order where you raised your hand. Uh, if I miss you, just write me in the chat and then I will keep track of this. So maybe Jan, next for you then. Uh, yes, uh, maybe directly related to the previous questions. Um, if there is no universal measurement, that is one thing. But what kind of definition for risks is used? For example, in all these areas, we can see that uh, as a meta risk, if you think of the fan that has been shown, that for example, government and government uh, actors are um, interrelated with the different versions of risks because they have to regulate all the various kinds. Now, what is their definition of risk to even approach the issue? especially if the different, uh, different risks are also interrelated in what they cause. I wonder about the definition. Um, maybe I start again. So unfortunately, we have the same situation as with the risk management. Um, uh, risk, risk measurement, there is no definition for uh, risk as a, um, a concept which is the same in different fields. So in medicine, risk is something else than in physics, than in mathematics, than in politics, than in economics. And um, so when we approach the concept of risk, uh, we could say, um, how much is the, how high is the probability of unintended consequences or how uh, big is the, um, uh, probability that an unwanted outcome in some area is happening. Now, if you think a, a little bit about that, then for one person, a specific outcome may be a risk. And for another person, the same outcome may be a wanted outcome. Therefore, um, the, um, the same event may not even be a risk uh, for two people, and they, they might have a different discussion about that. And uh, therefore, and to have a scientific um, risk definition um, is um, already difficult if you have one single scientific approach or one single event. Also there, you can have different um, ideas of what is risk. But if you um, combine it over different sciences or the different risk types uh, I have laid out earlier, there is no common definition. But a little bit more optimistic, maybe, as I said, the UN developed certain criteria, especially for this uh, disaster management. And uh, we have now many countries, including countries like North Korea, which adhere to them, making things more comparable. And But in, in that uh, respect, also this question of global warming. I have many friends in Russia who are fans of global warming. Yeah, and it, uh, not all of them will maybe get what they want from it. But uh, they have certain points there, including uh, huge uh, additional arable areas, etc., which they uh, could have it. And um, until now, we have much, much more people dying from uh, cold-related events than from heat-related events. It's are things we shouldn't forget that uh, would definitely shape our attitude toward a certain risk. And I'm not sure if you raised your hand. Did you want to ask something? Maybe I just misinterpreted. No? Okay, perfect. Then I also wanted to put in one thought, which I found very interesting. Um, I recently read the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, and he has one chapter on rare events. And he is writing that humans tend to either overestimate or completely ignore rare events. He's making the point there are three criteria which lets us overestimate if it's given to us in a percentage and even more if it's a relative probability, one out of 10,000. Second, if it provides a vivid image for us in our mind. And third, if we truly come to fear something. These are factors that drive us to overestimate rare events and risks. However, on the other hand, there are risks which we completely ignore. And typically, these are risks that are associated to having experienced them. And then this ignorance takes place when humans never experienced a certain risk before. For me, it was with MERS. I, it was the first time I ever came close to any kind of 
pandemic situation. And he's making the point there that uh, this also leads to some sort of disaster cycle. There is a reaction which might be exaggerated in some extent, but then there's neglect. There is no middle ground there. And this might like, provide for the question, like how can we as humans with all our biases and cognitive limitations be able to better deal with risks? How can we be more uh, cognizant of statistics that underlie them? Bernhard? <laughs> After you, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, so a rare events to, to start with that. Um, I actually share the um, opinion that we um, do not take the probability in a right way and um, that in the end we come up with a, a fear of a thing where we don't need to fear it and we uh, neglect other things and uh, uh, this neglection of other things we have seen in the financial crisis or in the COVID-19 that happens not only with the normal people, but that is something where all the experts and politicians and professors around the world have also a wrong uh, perception. So uh, that is sometimes following the crowd uh, type of perspective both in overestimating or in underestimating uh, risks with, which we have. And um, I mean, the only way um, against that, what I can uh, share is to speak about risks all the time, all your life with very different people about very different risks. And then you become a little bit more risk aware and you have a little bit more view on what might happen and uh, how big the probability is. But in the end, suddenly a risk happens and you are not as well prepared as you uh, would like to be. Okay, I agree with you, but first of all, I want to say if we were all like that, would talk all our life about risk, we had no more entrepreneurs. That would not be good. Entrepreneurship is the deliberate neglect of risks. If you think of investing in real estate or investing in new businesses or so, you can only do if you simply black that out. Uh, the second point, uh, maybe more an illustration, and, and it's an observation being a German in Korea, this uh, debate about data protection in Germany, it really uh, got me crazy. If you think how many risks we entail through uh, the spread of COVID-19 in Germany and how many people died and how many people died in really miserable circumstances where old people uh, died alone basically and uh, funerals could not be held re the real way and just for this fetish of data protection and I'm really I, I'm a liberal conservative economist but I I simply don't get it. And here I was in Itaewon drinking with a friend uh, and this famous Itaewon cluster came up of uh, gay bars and uh, suddenly I got a um, call. Hey, um, you were also in the Itaewon cluster because they just took 10 days and everybody who has been for more than half an hour in Itaewon um, uh, was then cited for a COVID test and nobody made a real problem out of it. It happened like that and it was good they did it. So that's a little bit my challenge for you also, because many of you live in Germany. I don't know how you see it. I simply uh, don't get it why there's no greater outcry for um, better protection through less data protection. We have two more questions at the moment. So the first one is from Tobias and then it is from Florian Perking, Tobias. Yeah, hello, thank you for your insightful speeches, Professor Deville and Dr. Seliger. Uh, my question is, uh, especially in light of COVID-19 and the conspiracy theories in social media, is social media some, a risk which needs to be managed? And if so, uh, how can it be managed? Thank you. I have an opinion to that. Certainly there are risks in social media, but Usually, if the government manages these risks, uh, things get worse. 
because we come to basically we come to censorship. That's what Twitter did by, with Trump. You might not like Trump, but it was censorship. And it's questionable if a company which is so monopolistic on the market should have done so, just cut off somebody's tweet. I mean, because you'd never know who is the one who pushes the button there and who decides on that. So I rather think there, certainly there are lots of crazy people in the uh, social media, but it, uh, to have uh, one publicly paid um, broadcasting system, it's in North Korea called propaganda, and we think bad of it. And so think of the possibilities then of social media. You should see the costs and the um, opportunities. And I would say they are massively outweighing. And uh, secondly, I also think that uh, technically it's not really easy to efficiently and justly at the same time regulate these things because they will find other outlets. And yeah, I would uh, completely agree to Bernhard there. I think the um, not the, the social media is risk, but it's more the underlying uh, question: What is the truth? What are the facts? What is reality? And um, these questions we have had for thousands of years in our human development. That uh, sometimes we uh, have. Um, developments where we see the truth different in science or in political societal developments than in the years or centuries before. So um, the real question is about um, how to address the facts and how to make sure that we can, and um, if there is a, let's call it conspiracy theory or something where we think it's wrong or where we do not know whether it's wrong or truth. Um, that we can check it. How can we make, uh, how can we have um, risk mitigation measures in place that we can check social media or government, government uh, um, official uh, announcements or some news articles or a scientific journal article? How can we really make sure that we have the possibility to check whether the evidence is there or not? So that is a risk. And maybe to make an example on the wearing masks. I mean, you have from the health minister to the most uh, outstanding virologist in Germany in February or March uh, 2020, they said ma wearing masks is nonsense. And now you have, you're going out in parks, you're going at night jogging and you have to wear, a, what is it called in Germany, FFP2 mask or whatever, K94 we say here. That is crazy, isn't it? But it was so. Who would have decided then what is the truth in February and March 2020? Should you have said those who uh, ask for more masks, they do, they are the conspiracy theorists because they think of these crazy things, oh. the virus could somehow miraculously uh, come up there? Or would it be now the people who all the time said uh, we don't need masks were those the conspiracy theorists? So it's really very difficult. The truth is evolving. Perfect. Then, as next, we have Florian Pöcking, followed by Rebecca Reinecke, and then Jan Sofinowski. Okay, thank you, but it has already been dealt with. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, perfect. Then we proceed with Rebecca. Um, yes, I would like to ask if uh, you think that the situation in Seoul has changed since the first lockdown, because um, I think one big risk that comes from the people in Germany is actually their behavior towards refusing wearing masks and pushing those conspirational theories. And as I experienced the first lockdown in Seoul, I felt like there's nothing like that in the Korean culture, really, that, they, that the people would actually accept the governmental rules. And I would like to know if there's a change in the behavior of the people and yeah, maybe you can give an answer. I mean, uh, actually, there was, there were, I would say there were two developments. After the first lockdown, we had this long period over the summer with very, very low figures. And many Koreans started to get used to the idea that basically the danger is over. And then we had this upshot uh, just in November and December and the second lockdown. And um, 
uh, now uh, from this uh, one day when we had 1400 cases, which would uh, not be any news in Germany, uh, only good news, but here it was really bad news and people really changed their behavior. I mean, sorry to say so, but I, I did skiing a few times this year. It was the best skiing I ever had in Korea because usually the slopes are crowded and full and it was completely empty. And they had a rule of one third of uh, capacity they could use, but I think there was much less than one tenth of capacity. So people really stay at home. It's a little different with certain lockdown rules. We had here extremely politicized rules. For example, Taekwondo uh, parlors were open, but uh, uh, Komdo, uh, Kendo or uh, uh, Yudo or Sung had to close. Uh, cafes had to close, but um, uh, restaurants could be open. And uh, actually that pushed many companies to the bankruptcy. There was political opposition, but fortunately with the success, obvious success of the second lockdown now, these routes are uh, slowly relaxed. And um, so maybe also the political opposition, but the people were really, uh, it, it is so empty in Seoul also, if you go out, well, anyway, can only go out until nine in the evening, uh, but it's uh, really changed a lot. Yeah, I would say so. Then, uh, Professor Dewey, do you want to add? Otherwise, I would hand over to the next questions raiser. That would be Jan, I think. I think you raised your hand, right? Uh, yes, I did. Um, uh, you said before about the, um, uh, the issues around transparency and that, uh, for example, the biologists in Germany changed their uh, view on how to use masks, et cetera, PP, uh, which also happened in other countries and with the WHO and so on and so forth. And I think um, it's not just a, a transparency issue and that the truth is evolving. It's also, um, I think there comes in risk perception because uh, before um, the masks, uh, they don't, they, they're used to save others from you because they're more useful in that aspect. Um, but the perception changed that uh, if you don't have masks, the risk is too high. And that had to be communicated and they failed at that communication. So people couldn't make the step of why suddenly masks are good. So there's an issue about um, uh, the, the management of the risk and the perception of the same ongoing risk. Uh, maybe you could say something to that. Well, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the point I wanted to make is that the Ministry of Truth would maybe not be a good, sorry to be a little uh, polemic, but not good idea to say that now we, we establish the truth because it is simply often not there completely. But I agree with you that the fear of the event, and I think that's what uh, uh, Volker de Ville also said, that the fear of the event really, or the risk perception is an uh, essential point in how we deal with certain risks. And that uh, perception, again, might be right or wrong. I still maintain that the attitude of Koreans towards uh, fine dust was largely irrational in the past. On the other hand, it prepared them well for Corona, yeah. Yeah, and just to add uh, uh, one aspect, in the beginning in Germany, the Robert Koch Institute, they had the fear if they promote the masks too much, and uh, that then the people would think that they are safe and they don't need to have distance and uh, to each other and don't need to wash their hands all the time. Uh, so that was a fear why they were hesitant to promote the masks in the beginning. I mean, that has changed now completely. We have two more questions. Um, first from Diana and one second would be from Lisa. And I also wanted to uh, introduce one thought. Of I, what I found very fascinating and maybe a kind of linked academic field would be a network science. I had the opportunity to participate in a course about scale-free networks and how resilient they are. So when we think about how we set up our power grid and how we set how our immune system works, how our society works, is there like fascinating studies, how we can make them resilient towards an, uh, uh, an attacker that would be choosing them arbitrarily. Uh, but then this comes as a trade-off with 
um, a heightened um, vulnerability to the deliberate takeout of network nodes. I found this very interesting academic field and there is a, a book by uh, Barabasi on, on this kind of uh, linked issues and networks. I would now hand over to Diana, who also raised the question or mentioned she would like to comment. Yes, I basically wanted to add to this uh, risk perception issue that was uh, raised concerning the data protection and also how we deal with the uh, risk of the virus. And I just wanted to mention that uh, risk is actually always shaped by experience. And this goes actually to uh, what uh, Felix already mentioned, this um, this book by Kahneman, they are actually psychologists, right? So they are um, they are actually not economists, but they are psychologists, but they uh, kind of add to the uh, behavioral economists, um, economic science, which is different from traditional economics where you have like um, objective um, probabilities that, uh, yeah, where you can just predict the risk and so on. And the homo economicus who's very rational and very, like data oriented has all the information and makes always the rational choices that just does not exist in real life it's like we are humans we are we have um, heuristics you would call it in uh, Kahneman's term like we use biases we do not um, we are not computers so all the information that we get it's limited and we have also limited brain capacity to um, kind of deal with all these data that we have and that's why I think in the current pandemic, first of all, um, we, we have very biased perceptions of these risks and they are also shaped by our past experiences. So um, if I experienced a shock, let, let's say um, an economic shock, so in financial economics, there's a lot of research about that, uh, how people change their risk perception after experiencing um, a financial crisis, for example. And I think that also happened, uh, or you can apply that for the case of Korea and how they dealt with the virus because they already had some experience with the uh, MERS and also other um, SARS infections and pandemics that only, that stayed actually in East Asia and did not spread to the world. So they already were kind of more aware of such risk um, and also more um, aware of uh, how how well masks can actually uh, protect you from such risk. And whereas we are in Germany, we, we totally have no experience with that. Um, and also with the data protection, I'm not exactly sure, but you always say in Germany that it is also like this fear of um, data uh, abuse, like when we share too much of our personal information, that is also related to our past experiences. I'm not exactly sure, but this is what I what I hear when I talk to other people, like the, the experience with the um, the East uh, German uh, like DDR, uh, GDR, um, and how they actually yeah, abuse our private information. And the Koreans do not really have that experience. So at least in South Korea, and or maybe Dr. Zeliga <laughs> disagrees. Um, but related to that, I heard something interesting from a friend of mine. Um, he said. Um, we deal in Korea, the people deal differently when they experience, let's say they would experience the um, abuse of personal information, then they would just like go on the street like they did with Park Geun-hye and kind of protest until the government um, steps down or kind of reacts to that. So in Korea, apparently they believe that if like if the government misuses their trust, that they only use the data for their safety, then like um, they would like the public has enough power to kind of um, yeah kind of deal with that. So the democratic power of the people themselves is apparently different than in Germany, where apparently in Germany we are we don't think that we would as the people have the power to um, to tell the government this is wrong what you did. So. That's my, my few points that I wanted to make. Looking at the agenda, we are over the time for the discussion now, but maybe we can just round up the questions and then get a collective response from both of you, if that would be fine. And I saw one raise from Lisa and the next one would be Florian Perking. Uh, yes, so I have uh, one more question going in line with um, like individual experiences or um, like individual 
like the past of different individuals or countries. Um, is it even possible then to kind of learn from each other or to um, even learn from one's own past if risk management is something so unique and individual to everyone? Uh, so, I mean, is it that I always have to start all over again when I need to assess a certain risk? Or is there a way that, for example, uh, European countries could somehow learn from Asian countries from this pandemic, for example? Thank you. Thank you. And then to Florian Perkin. Yes, maybe only shortly. I would have a number of comments on especially what Diana just said. And um, well, there is the issue of collective experience uh, in addition to personal ones. And there's a profound difference between um, Germany and Korea, especially in um, how we dealt with our collective um, memory and collective experience regarding our recent past. Um, and there seems to be an, in, well, there's a narrative of this ingrained fear of Germans of losing their individual freedom to the government as we experienced it in the Third Reich under the Nazi regime. There should, there is a narrative in Korea that there should be a similar fear of losing their personal freedom in regard to the dictatorial um, presidency under Park Chung-hee and Tun Do-hwan, which is not so far in the past which was completely dealt with, uh, completely differently dealt with um, in how the collective um, experience, the collective memory on these two times was shaped in Korea and Germany. And I think this is also uh, one of a major factor that um, contributes to how we perceive the current COVID-19 crisis, but also other crises and how we deal with our respective governments. Um, but well, we could go on and on with this. It's just a, just a short comment. Then we can maybe hand over to Professor Singer and Professor David. Do you want to make final statements before we start in our deserved 10 minute break? Yeah, I, I will be very brief. So uh, Florian, I, uh, the fear is really uh, something which is driving risk perceptions and uh, uh, how the people in different countries in different situations look on risk. And I agree, we can go for, uh, for a long lecture there. And uh, um, Lisa, your um, question about uh, could we learn from each other? I mean, I'm um, making a um, risk uh, management lecture and case study every half year here at Bayreuth University. And it's always interesting again, and I can always add new aspects. And although the students are from all over the world, um, it is something which we, we as human beings in each situation have to train and to learn again. So there is no easy way that suddenly we are risk aware. That is a long process. And Diana, to your um, um, behavioral economics, your first statement, and so homo economicus, um, I would agree that after we, the, this pandemic ends, that uh, the colleagues uh, who are economists in behavioral um, uh, science, in behavioral economics, that they will uh, have uh, a close look on how this pandemic worked and how the perception worked and how the decision were made. I think that will be interesting. So that were my comments. Okay, I will add one thing to this question. Can we learn from each other? Koreans are the, the greatest benchmarkers in the world. And for example, in my own field, I don't know, I, I really every year have, I would say at least a hundred uh, meetings on the topic, uh, what can we learn from German unification? I don't say they are all productive. Many are very redundant and uh, counterproductive, but uh, what I really uh, find sad that we seem to be much, in Germany, much less open to learning from Korea than the other way around. And and I, I, I absolutely agree on these long-term and, and undercurrents we have from our experience or so. But if you think of such beautiful things like a Kakao Talk app, and you have this QR code, and you go to the restaurant and put your QR code there, you don't write your name and nothing. Naturally, the government knows that. But that, I find, is a very practical solution and a very handy solution to a problem we have now, a problem which is a problem of life and death in Germany, 
but not in Korea. And one, that is one of the reasons, because they are very pragmatic. So this pragmatism of the Koreans, I find uh, fabulous. And I find really something we in Germany maybe could learn something from and, and overcome our, our long term uh, suspicions. And so when it goes to something like fighting a pandemic. Thank you very much. Looking at the time, we now need to come to the end of our first half of our discussion. So we just concluded um, our uh, presentations, our discussion series. There will be a 10 minute break um, during which we will show, we will share the screen and show you a video uh, introducing our network. And then let us reconvene at um, 80 minutes past 1 p.m. German time. Im Jahr 2002 befand sich Korea mitten in der Sonnenscheinpolitik. Es war Fußballweltmeisterschaft in Korea und Japan und Bundespräsident Johannes Rau hat einen Staatsbesuch in Korea und Japan gemacht und es waren vor allem Persönlichkeiten aus der koreanischen Zivilgesellschaft, die sehr darauf gedrungen haben, dass es zur Gründung eines deutsch-koreanischen Forums kommt und ich habe den Bundespräsidenten damals nach Korea begleitet und konnte bei der Gründung des Forums in Seoul dabei sein. Vor acht Jahren ist uns etwas aufgefallen beim Deutsch-Koreanischen Forum, nämlich dass etwas fehlt. Und was fehlt? Das seid ihr. Das ist die junge Generation, denn Freundschaft kann nur bestehen, wenn diese Freundschaft in die nächste Generation getragen wird. Und deswegen haben wir uns entschlossen, vor acht Jahren ein deutsch-koreanisches Junior Forum zu gründen. Im Jahr 2016 hat die Stadt Seoul der Bundeskanzlerin Angela Merkel den Seoul Peace Award verliehen. Und die Bundeskanzlerin ist ähm, an das deutsch-koreanische Forum herangetreten, um diesen Preis einem idealen Zweck im Zusammenhang mit den deutsch-koreanischen Beziehungen zuzuführen. Das Deutsch-Koreanische Junior Forum 2018 in Daejeon war eine einmalige Erfahrung für mich, weil es das erste Mal war, dass man in einer Gruppe aus jungen Menschen in Korea unterwegs war. Und aus dieser Erfahrung haben sich bis heute langfristige Freundschaften entwickelt. Das war das erste Forum, in welchem es vorab ein einwöchiges Einführungsseminar in Seoul gab, welches sehr interessant war und mich nachhaltig geprägt hat. Das Einführungsseminar hat mir tolle Einblicke in Land und Kultur gegeben. Als Beispiel kann hier das zweitägige Einführungsseminar vom Bildungsministerium in Korea genannt werden. Und neben sehr vielen interessanten, tollen Veranstaltungen hatten wir auch die Möglichkeit, das Nachtleben Souls zu erkunden. Am Ende durfte ich unsere Empfehlungen vortragen. Obwohl ich mir vorher große Sorgen gemacht habe, habe ich zum Glück gutes Feedback vom Senior Forum bekommen. Ich war letztes Jahr, also 2019, mit dabei bei dem Forum hier in Berlin. Das Besondere an diesem Forum war, dass wir eine Einführungswoche hatten, zusammen mit den koreanischen Teilnehmern. Bei unserem Einführungsseminar war es so, dass wir inhaltlich zwei Themenschwerpunkte hatten. Zum einen die deutsche Wiedervereinigung, weil wir 30 Jahre Mauerfall gefeiert haben, und zum anderen natürlich die deutsch-koreanischen Beziehungen. Deshalb waren wir auch unter anderem im Auswärtigen Amt und in der südkoreanischen Botschaft, aber auch im Kanzleramt und wir haben Mitglieder der deutsch-koreanischen Parlamentarier getroffen. Neben diesem ganzen Lernen und Diskutieren ist aber natürlich auch der soziale Aspekt nicht zu vergessen, denn so konnte man während dieser Einführungswoche die anderen Teilnehmer viel besser kennenlernen und auch neue Freundschaften schließen. Deshalb hoffe ich, dass dieses Einführungsseminar auch in Zukunft beibehalten wird. Ich finde, es ist eine einmalige Chance, an so einem Forum teilzunehmen. Normalerweise lernt man ja im Unterricht eher das Theoretische und dann an so einem Forum kann man das Theoretische dann auch mal anwenden und vertiefen. Außerdem lernt man andere Deutsche kennen, die viel Interesse haben an Korea und umgekehrt Koreaner, die sich für Deutschland interessieren. Wir haben dann überzeugen können, dass man das deutsch-koreanische Junior Forum dadurch verstetigen kann, indem man ein Netzwerk Junge Generation Deutschland-Korea gründet. 2019 wurde das Netzwerk gegründet und ich fühlte mich geehrt, dabei sein zu dürfen. Jetzt ist es dank des Einsatzes von 
Abgeordneten des Deutschen Bundestages, sowohl aus der deutsch-koreanischen Parlamentariergruppe, aber auch aus dem Haushaltsausschuss gelungen, für das Netzwerk Haushaltsmittel aus dem Haushalt des Bundesministeriums für Familie zur Verfügung zu stellen. Und deshalb konnten wir in diesem Jahr das Netzwerk ins Leben rufen. Als Projektleiter des Netzwerks Junge Generation Deutschland-Korea ist es zunächst einmal meine Aufgabe, die vielen ehemaligen Teilnehmer des deutsch koreanischen Junior Forums aus einer Art Dornröschenschlaf zu wecken. Darüber hinaus ist es mein Job, belastbare Strukturen und ein belastbares Fundament für unsere Arbeit aufzubauen. Schließlich sehe ich es auch noch als meinen Job an, ein motiviertes Team aufzubauen, das selbst zum Träger und zum Motor des Netzwerkes wird und ihm so Leben einhaucht. Mein Ziel ist es, die deutsch-koreanische Freundschaft voranzubringen und ich freue mich, dass ich das in diesem Netzwerk so gut kann. Alle werden gehört, alle dürfen mitmachen und alle können Ideen einbringen. Für mich bedeutet das Netzwerk in der Zukunft, dass wir die Möglichkeit haben, deutsch-koreanische Beziehungen zu stärken und den Platz zu schaffen für die Jugend, für den Nachwuchs und für das Potenzial, sich beruflich weiterzuentwickeln. Das Netzwerk ist ein Ort der Begegnung. Denn nur persönliche Begegnungen können einen intensiven kulturellen, wirtschaftlichen und politischen Austausch ermöglichen und Vorurteile abbauen. Unser Netzwerk schafft Bedeutendes. Es ermöglicht, neue Freundschaften zu knüpfen und in Kontakt zu bleiben. Das Netzwerk ermöglicht den Austausch zwischen Deutschland und Korea auf einer Vielzahl an Ebenen. Und genau das ist unser Ziel, denn wir wollen die junge Generation zusammenführen, denn wir sind es letztendlich, die diese Beziehung aufrechterhalten wird. Wir arbeiten aufgrund der aktuellen Lage am Aufbau des Netzwerkes rein digital. Dazu benutzen wir Plattformen wie beispielsweise Zoom oder Trello. Und wir haben uns zudem in verschiedene Arbeitsgruppen eingeteilt, um möglichst viele Themen abzudecken. Ich bin in der Arbeitsgruppe 2 und wir sind hauptsächlich dafür zuständig, uns um die interne Kommunikation und um den Aufbau des Netzwerkes zu kümmern. Momentan beschäftige ich mich mit der südkoreanischen Seite, also ich versuche da den Kontakt zu halten und habe auch schon nachgefragt, wie das aussieht, ob da auch ein Interesse bestände, so ein Netzwerk weiterzuführen und habe sehr positive Rückmeldungen bekommen. Deshalb hoffe ich, dass auch in Zukunft ein ähnliches Netzwerk dort aufgebaut werden kann, sodass wir noch intensiver miteinander arbeiten können. Auf das Forum bin ich über Facebook aufmerksam geworden. Dort habe ich einen Aufruf des Forums für Teilnehmer gesehen. Nach dem Forum konnte ich über Social Media im aktiven Kontakt mit meinen Freunden aus dem Forum bleiben. Ich bin sehr froh darüber, dass wir in dieser schwierigen Zeit digital zusammenarbeiten und gemeinsam Ideen für Online-Projektkampagnen entwickeln können. Mein aktuelles Projekt für das Netzwerk ist das Erstellen eines Corona-Konzeptpapiers. Wir haben uns darüber Gedanken gemacht, wie die Corona-Krise sich auf Deutschland und Korea ausgewirkt hat, welche Maßnahmen dort getroffen wurden und wollen dies in einem Konzeptpapier, in einer Veröffentlichung zusammenfassen. Das deutsch-koreanische Forum und Junior Forum sind wichtige Berater und Impulsgeber der deutsch-koreanischen Beziehungen. Allerdings tagen sie nur einmal im Jahr und entsprechend selten sind auch die Impulse, die sie an Gesellschaft und Politik ausgeben. Das Netzwerk nun arbeitet das ganze Jahr über. Es ist ein Austauschprogramm und Sprachrohr getragen von der Jugend für die Jugend beider Länder. Mit jedem Thesenpapier, mit jedem Facebook- oder Instagram-Post oder jedem Diskussionsbeitrag, den das Netzwerk transportiert, verleiht es der Stimme der Jugend Gewicht und Gehör. Digital sind wir bereits recht aktiv. Sobald es die Rahmenbedingungen aber zulassen, möchten wir den internationalen Austausch und die Begegnung der jungen Menschen wieder auch persönlich ermöglichen. Dazu organisieren wir regelmäßige Veranstaltungen, aber auch Workshops. Das deutsch-koreanische Junior Forum ist ähm, ein Ort der Begegnung junger Menschen. Dort werden häufig progressive Ideen formuliert, die ähm, weniger abhängig von, von alten, bekannten Wegen sind. Deutschland und Korea verbindet eine gemeinsame Geschichte der Teilung, eine sehr, sehr starke wirtschaftliche Innovationskraft und eine starke Wiederaufbaumentalität. Auf diesen Erfahrungen und diesen Stärken möchten wir nun aufbauen und die Freundschaft auf eine neue Ebene heben. Das schaffen wir gemeinsam. 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 Gemeinsam.
Hi everyone, great to have you back and to start the second part of our session Gemeinsam as well. In our second part, we will have three presentations on different aspects of risk. So one of our intentions, which we had before our meeting was that we can give young researchers, young experts a platform to share their perspectives, to share their research or their work. And we are very grateful that we have three presentations today. We will first have the presentation by Julie Kim on legal and um, border control aspects of the corona response in Korea. Then this will be followed by a presentation by Yoon Jung Kim looking into what's the policy origins of the emergency use authorization for vaccines are comparing the US possibly with a different source of policy compared to South Korea. And then in the end, we have a presentation by Tobias Kashor on legal aspects of risk management. We will then conclude with a short round of um, remarks from you, where we welcome you to give us a short statement what you took from today. And um, if time permits, we might have also a round of discussion. And without further ado, let me hand over to Julie Kim for the presentation. Um, so I will share my screen. Uh, we can, uh, see, can your screen. see the screen. Oh, yes. yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Okay, so um, hello uh, again, my name is Yuli Kim and I am a PhD student at the Department of Geography in Seoul National University. And um, this is actually a really beginning of my research. So I, I think parts of the presentation might be quite rough. So I would appreciate comments and questions at the end that could um, help me develop my paper even further. Um, so the title of my presentation is The Legal Geography of Border Control and Migrant Bodies, an Outlook of South Korea's Immigration Act. And um, yeah, so I will jump right into it. Uh, oh, oops, sorry, I had the wrong script out. Mm -hmm. Oops, excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay. Yeah, so from um, the start of the COVID-19 outbreak in the beginning of last year, uh, one of the major issues that came to surface was the issue of border control and, and travel restrictions. Um, and coming from an age of migration and mobility where net migration flows never ceased to grow since World War II. And so this international tourism grew from 25 million arrivals worldwide in 1950 to 1 1.4 billion in 2018. Um, it was quite shocking to see the opposite, um, the massive closing down of na nation state borders throughout the world. Uh, it is within this context of a dramatic shift in the pandemic era that I review the current legislation of border control and the regulation of bodies, especially migrant bodies, um, through an outlook of the current setup of the Cur South Korea's Immigration Act. Um, and I want to discuss how the current framing of the Immigration Act is not suitable to address the changing landscape of domestic migration patterns and the risk of COVID. Um, so for South Korea, which has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world. Uh, immigration is particularly important in trying to fill the gaps of, for example, the educational sector and, and the immigrate and the, sorry, the employment sector market. And so until the COVID, the South Korean government in all sectors were trying to uh, attract global talent. So as you can see in the, the study in Korea website, um, they've, they have many scholarships now um, uh, trying to attract international students. Um, and especially since this, uh, we are pop facing a huge population decline in the regional areas of Korea, the, the regional universities are trying to um, 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 fill in their student population with international students. And um, 
uh, talking about the Ministry of Employment and, and Labor, they're collaborating with the Ministry of Justice to make visa pol policies more lenient and, and create new visa categories to employ seasonal workers and, and introduce family invitation visas all for, um, for the goal of, of trying to get more workers into the employment market here. And so in that sense, COVID is posing a big obstacle to South Korean strategies in attracting migrants. Um, but in my paper, I want to demonstrate how the COVID is challenging the outdated immigration infrastructure, um, in which in my opinion had been outdated even before the COVID crisis. And I want to discuss how the COVID can be an opportunity to reimagine immig the immigration system in South Korea. So uh, in order to examine um, the relation between space, law, and bodies, um, this is sort of my framework. Uh, I use the framework of legal geography. And, and since I'm a geography major, I had to put this in here somehow. And um, so law is always happening somewhere. And, and legal geographers have attempted to demonstrate how there's a spatiality to law, which means that um, there is a space that provides the context where law is produced and practiced. It also means that the boundaries of law define space and inform spatial practices. Um, and so in my, in my paper, I focus on the spatiality of borders and how bordering practices are made in the legal execution of the Immigration Act and, and vice versa. So um, here are some of my research questions. How is the Immigration Act a product of pre-COVID spatiality of border management, which presumes a constant flow of human mobility? And is the Immigration Act a product of the pre-COVID era still relevant in the post-COVID era? If not, how should it be reconfigured? And, and in order to do so, I con conduct a documentary analysis of the Immigration Act. This is Churiko Kualipa, for those of you who know Korean. Um, and and this, and I use also the Ministry of Justice and Migrant Statistics from, um, oh, sorry, so the Migrant Statistics from the Korea Immigration Service. Uh, so before I dive into my arguments, I want to show, provide an overview of the Immigration Act. Um, while movement between borders and its administrative regulation existed before the modern age, uh, border control operations in South Korea are seen to have started with uh, when the government was first established um, in 1948 after independence from Japanese colonization. Um, and in 1963, uh, during the Third Republic period, uh, that was when the Immigration Act was first legislated. Um, and, and that was when the solid legal basis was consolidated for border control operations. Um, so the Third Republic was when the South Korean econ economy grew rapidly uh, with the large success of nation's export economy, uh, mobility of ships, aircraft, and people began to accelerate rapidly. And before that, so the legislation was specified just for foreigners. That was the target population. Um, and nationals didn't fly out as much, but since then, more and more national citizens also began to move across borders around, um, around this period. And the Immigration Act began to include more comprehensive measures for both foreigners and nationals. And, um, and so with the ordinance of the Immigration Act on March 5th, 1963, um, border control operations became more independent and institutionalized than before. And this act continues to function as the foundation for overall immigration and administration to this day. Uh, so if you look at Article 1, that it states the purpose of this act, which is to provide for matters concerning safe border controls through the immigration control of all nationals and aliens who enter or depart from the Republic of Korea, control over the stay of aliens in the Republic of Korea, and social integration, etc. And this act is divided into 11 chapters with a total of 106 articles. And as you can see from this list, um, it impacts both uh, Korean nationals and foreigners, uh, covers the topic of entry and departure of nationals and foreigners, and then the stay and integration, uh, deport, de deportation and penalty measures, and, and, and social integration, et cetera, among others. And so, um, so I want to turn, uh, return to my research questions and, 
And, and the first thing I want to demonstrate is how um, the Immigration Act was a product of pre-COVID era when um, the cross-border mobility was a lot more um, uh, fluid than now. Um, so the pre as, uh, so the pre-COVID um, spatiality of border management assumes a constant in and out, a constant entry and departure of many individuals, which I think is, would, would be very different from a post-COVID spatiality, which is no longer based on flow, um, but stagnancy and sort of sedentarism. We're all on lockdown and, and et cetera. So I base my argument on two points. Um, one is terminology. So the Immigration Act, um, in English, is an adaptation of the Korean phrasing which literally translates to Departure and Entry Management Act. Um, this is also the same for the Korea Immigration Service, which in Korean is which is Departure and Entry and Foreigner Policy Headquarters. So although it's not really apparent in the English translation of the law in Korean, um, this, the, the meaning of immigration is actually reduced to managing departure and entry matters um, as, as in the name of the law and the, the immigration service itself. And so, but I want to argue that since immigration, it encompasses selection, admission, settlement, and deportation of foreign residents residing in the country. It includes the component of residency um, in a destination country. I, I, I am arguing that um, the Immigration Act needs to go beyond this, this idea of departure and entry and controlling at the borders um, into sort of the aspect of set settlement and residency. That's, that's my main argument for my paper. Uh, uh, this actually becomes more apparent when looking at the proportion of articles, um, the, the articles, the law articles um, in the Immigration Act, which is allotted to uh, departure, departure and entry compared to settlement and residency. Um, so I, uh, from, from these uh, 11 chapters and 106 articles, I went and, and I classified um, the different articles that belong to the departure and entry sec section and the settlement and residency section. And um, the first set of articles um, totaled up to 49 articles and, and the settlement and residency, there were 22. Uh, and so from this, we can infer that the current Immigration Act emphasizes border control, which would have been important in an era of constant mobility flows. But in the post-COVID era, um, the characteristic of immigration as residency and settlement has become more important than migration as a flow. And this is something that um, South Korea, um, I think, is still resisting. We've, we are getting used to the idea of multiculturalism and having migrants around in the peninsula. But um, I, I think the, the view, the, the, per, the prevailing view is that they'll be here for a while and then they'll leave. And, and so it's not, um, so the long-term settlement idea is still quite new, I think, for, for South Koreans. So, um, and I also wanted to briefly mention how the Immigration Act regulates migrant bodies. Um, so uh, I found that in the act, uh, there are, the act has the power, the Immigration Act has the power to digitize and dissect, classify, fine and detain and deport the migrant body. And um, these practices of controlling the migrant body at the border, uh, it follows the migrants into the border and continues to impact their livelihoods during their residency in the country. And um, and uh, I mean, so recently, the, there has been a tightening of, of, con of collecting biometric data. So it was only amended last year. Before it was just fingerprinting and photographing, but now the, the Korean government has um, um, expanded this even further and, and now can collect all sorts of biometric data. They haven't specified anything, um, but it's it's just broadened. And, and um, this actually uh, sort, of, sort of signifies this digitized dissection of the body at the border. And, um, and also, 
uh, right. So in the article, that also foreigners are required to possess a passport and visa. And the type of visa, it defines the purpose of stay and employment activities. And um, this is particularly um, strict, I think, uh, just as um, um, one of the presentations earlier mentioned how, uh, I think we, we discussed the pragmatism of the Korean society at large. And, and one of the ways that um, uh, pragmatism was sort of um, outlined in the immigration in sector was um, because we wanted to bring in a lot more of these seasonal workers and migrant workers, the visa section has been getting very, very detailed and, it, and the visa categories have been, uh, uh, so not, not only E9, but we have E92 visa, E9, and then this also uh, is separated into various sectors and, and, and we continue to add on visa categories in order to address um, sort of new trends of trying to uh, bring in immigrants. And, and, um, and so the Immigration Act has been the foundation for, for how, they, how the visa category is, is impacting, um, is, is um, sort of bringing in new migrants and impacting how the, the, their terms of stay in South Korea. Um, so, and not only that, not, not only this, this uh, impacting, uh, sort of delineating their visa status, the Immigration Act, also, um, also it sort of outlines how migrants should conduct themselves. If you look at Article 10-3, um, migrants intending to acquire permanent residency, they need to meet the following requirements. And one of that is uh, he, she shall be of good conduct. Um, and then also here, um, they need to have basic knowledge necessary to continuously live as a national of the Republic of Korea, such as Korean language cap capability and the understanding of um, Korean society and culture. So, so as you can see, uh, the Immigration Act determines the conditions of how migrant bodies will reside in the nation. And um, since it determines the duration of how long a migrant can legally stay, um, where uh, and whether the body can participate in employment activities, um, it, it is also determining the terms of integration into South Korean society. Uh, so I want to go to my last point, uh, which is to answer, is the Immigration Act still relevant in the post-COVID-19 era? Um, if not, how should it be reconfigured? Well, um, in the post-COVID era, where migration, migrant mobility is no longer based on flow, but long-term residency, um, immigration needs to expand beyond border management. And the trend of migration and migrant population within South Korea has uh, changed drastically since the beginning of 2020 last year. Um, namely, short-term visits have become minimal and long-term migrants are here to stay for an indefinite amount of time. And if you look at the statistics, the total arrivals, this is, um, that all nationals and foreigners included have plummeted from 7.8 million to 288,000 in September. And foreign arrivals have also taken a huge dip. Um, this is just foreigners from 1.3 million to 70,000 in September. Uh, however, at the same time, it is interesting to note that the drop in foreign residents, so this is uh, residents who, ha who have who um, have a, a legitimate visa and they're here to stay. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just, just to, just to wrap up. So the foreign residents are here to stay and, it, and they only dropped 0 0.4 million. And, um, and I'm trying to say that the immigration act should further. Oops. Yeah. So uh, should be um, adapted to uh, for the long-term migrants who are here to stay in post-COVID-19. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry about the time. <laughs> yeah, Thank you very I much. I didn't realize it was so long. <laughs> no worries. I have the unfortunate role of always looking at the agenda. So uh, this is why I sometimes might write to you. And we will now hand over to uh, Yoon Jin Kim. And we are very much interested in hearing from your perspective on the vaccine authorization.
We can see your screen, but so far uh, I can't hear you. Can, you. can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hello? We can hear you. Perfect. Uh, hi, my name is Hyunjung Kim. And today I'm going to discuss about the use of unapproved medical countermeasures in public health emergency comparing the United States and South Korea. And I think recently, all you guys have already heard about COVID-19 vaccines many times. For example, Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. And the United States began to give this vaccine shot without official FDA approvers or licensures. But we can use it right now, thanks to EUA, Emergency Use Authorization. So I think understanding of EUA is very important to establish effective public health risk management plan. Let's find the term first, EUA. EUA is a policy to allow distrib distribution and employment of investigational MCMs, medical countermeasures, or off-label use of approved medical countermeasures in response to public health emergency. So we already heard about EUA for COVID-19 vaccines or testing kits, but this EUA is very different than so-called compassionate use that is used for the last legal treatment for seriously ill patients. For example, uh, patients with terminal cancer phase have no effective anti-drug, anti-cancer drug any longer, then the patient can seek and try new investigational anti-cancer drug for last options. So this is individual level choice, but EUA is national level choice subject to whole populations. So both the United States and South Korea issued EUA for COVID-19 testing kits on the same day, February 1st, 2020, last year. However, the outcome goes different. In congressional test testimony on March 11 last year, the US House Oversight Committee chairwoman pointed out that Korean testing capacity is much higher than, than that of the United States. So she finally laid the questions to the US public health authorities in Congress. Why are we so far behind South Korea in testing and reporting this crisis? My research argued that different origins and policy evolution make different testing outcome. As you see in this table, the US EUA was legislated after 2001 anthrax letter of tech. After this bioterrorism, Homeland Security domain was emerged in the United States to prepare and respond against CBRN threat. CBRN is chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threat. And later, this policy evolved to cover all hazard public health threat, including from CBRN to emerging infectious disease. But the origination of this policy is bioterrorism. On the other hand, Korea, Korean EUA was legislated after 2015 Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS outbreak. And since the MERS outbreak, disease containment domain was emerged in South Korea to detect and diagnose infectious disease more effectively. As your result, the US EUA works for based on Project BioShield Act of 2004, which is a representative of the US biodefense policy. But Korean EUA works for based on the Medical Device Act. It means that Korean EUA only cover medical device like RT-PCR testing kits, but not for vaccine or drugs. <coughs> Sorry. And so my research summarized that US EUA is specialized to homeland security policy against 
low probability but high consequence event like bioterrorism or bio warfare, while Korean UA is specialized to like general public health policy against emerging infectious disease. So what happened in real world? The first image is the drive-through testing. That is the most popular testing model introduced by South Korea. Actually, Korea has considered how fast we can conduct large scale uh, the testing practice, practices. To do so, the most important thing is to make effective network between testing spots and laboratories and patients. <clears throat> there were many, many testing spots in Korea that local peoples are easy to get access. And then the collective sample from the spots are instantly delivered to the pre-designated labs. On the other hand, since the bioterrorism, the United States has developed MCM distribution system. It's like, it's kind of top-down system that drugs are stockpiled in federal first and then delivered to state and local level. And usually the local place are designated like large stadium that where the large populations is to get in together or delivering drugs by the postal systems. So United States has practiced these systems that drug can be delivered in the hand of every single citizens within 72 hours. This is what we call CRI, City Readiness Initiative Plan. Oh, sorry. So now testing number of United States is skyrocketed since the United States set up a new, new testing system and opened many other testing spots in every corner of the local counties. In this study, I cannot say this case is single the most important factor that determine Korea and South Korea, but I would like to say the origins and the evolution of this policy based on past experience may affect each nation's public health systems by their own ways. The Korean system evolves to, 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 to public health response system to detect and diagnose infectious disease more quickly and more accurately, while the United States evolved to homeland security defense system against severe threats or terrorism. So in summary, the drawback of limited testing in the United States comparing to South Korea is due to the different characteristic of EUA policies. So the take home point is that every country needs to revisit their policy and learn from how other country apply their policy and modify it accordingly their, their, their risk circumstance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we have our final presentation by Tobias Kazor for today. Yes. Okay, so, it seems like everyone can see my screen now. At least on my side, it's still black. Now, now, it, now we can see okay, it. Okay, okay. Uh, Okay, hello again. My name is Tobias Kacho and I'm here to talk about legal aspects of risk management. Um, I'm a bit deviating from the academic perspective and try to share with you my experience when it comes to risk management. So I think I already introduced myself, so I'll keep this part short. Um, just so that you know, I'm working both in-house at the company, advising company as a business lawyer, and at the same time as attorney at law with my own practice. So everything I'm sharing with you is like a um, mixture of the experience I gathered doing both th that jobs. 
And my general focus areas are international states law, pu public procurement law, and commercial arbitration. I have some dealings also with Korean companies, so I also try to put this into my presentation. Um, the general thing about risk management, uh, in my personal opinion, every employee or every consultant always must keep risk management in mind. It's a task of everyone, for some people with a lower extent, for some people with a bigger extent. And my general conclusion is already coming at the very beginning of this presentation. It is always important to get the full picture. So it's all, not always the right thing to just rely on the data you have. You need to try to gather more information. Um, you see a picture which is usually used in the context of a phenomenon called survivorship bias. So what is this picture displaying? Um, a mathematician was asked to tell how to best protect airplanes from being shut down. And he received this image. This image shows an airplane which returned from a combat strike. So all the red dots are um, hits of this airplane. And based on this data, the mathematician was told to tell the constructionist how to improve the armor of the airplane. So at first glance, if you look at the picture, it seems to be pretty obvious. So the weakest points of the airplane seem to be the red dots, because that's where the plane gets hit, right? Um, no, that's actually wrong. For a very simple reason, we need to look at the data. The data the mathematician uh, had was only of the data of the airplanes which came back. So these are airplanes which were actually successful. Uh, the data which was lacking was the shot entries of the airplanes which didn't come back. So actually, when it comes to the issue, which parts of the airplane should be protected better? We talk most likely about the green parts. So that's really the message I want to provide to you, get the full picture, because that's like an issue I experience every day in my work life, that people just don't get the full picture. I know it's very hard to gather this data, and I'll follow up with some um, more example of my daily working life. So it is from the legal perspective, but I hope you get some inspiration also for your research and also for your later work life. So, it is the task of the lawyer to be the pacemaker sometimes. Uh, setting the pace means you either can be the rabbit, as Koreans call it, pali pali, or the turtle, chonchani, and be a bit slower. Whether you should be acting fast or slow is a question of risk management. To provide you an example where, in my opinion, it's important to be fast. The general case is with contract negotiations. You enter contract negotiations with a potential business partner. In those cases, usually it's the best if you initiate the negotiations, if the lawyer submits his contract draft. Because if you're the first, this contract draft, the terms of the contract, the pricing included of the contract, is the starting point of negotiations. If the other party is first, you start from their negotiation point. However, this is only the general principles. There are also cases in contract negotiations where it's better to be slow and to wait. Um, let's take as an example the situation where your company wants to conclude a contract with a governmental body. And you entered into negotiations with the governmental body and you see that you are not able to perform the contractual obligations by yourself. So you need a subcontractor. What happens usually in those situations, the business units come to the lawyer and say, quick, we need both contracts, the one with the governmental body and the one with the subcontractor. The issue is, if you conclude the contract with the subcontractor first without knowing the final conditions between your end customer, which is the governmental body, and yourself, you cannot reflect um, the contractual conditions between you and the governmental body. So you have a contract with the governmental body, you have already concluded contract with a subcontractor, and you need to bear the risk you usually would like the subcontractor to bear. 
So this is a situation where I would recommend to act slow. Coming to the next example, the next catchphrase I use, avoid losing by winning, AKA think ahead. So this is a very hard issue for lawyers. Lawyers love to be right. Lawyers love to find a claim and to use the claim against the other party. But in the company perspective, what's most important is to maintain a good business relationship and at the end of the day to maintain most of the money. So in the context of risk management, again, imagine a situation, your company is selling a good to a business partner and the business partner paid you late. Usually in that case, when a business partner pays you late, you have the right to claim damages in the amount of an interest rate. But if we look at the full picture, imagine this business partner also used to have claims in the parts. For example, you delivered the goods late, which means the, your business partner had the right to claim damages in the amount of a contractual penalty clause, but he never used that clause against you. The very moment you try to enact your right by claiming interest, you might be winning, so to speak, but in the long term, you might be losing because as I mentioned, a business partner might have never um, claimed his rights against you, but he will remember that. And in the long run, he might be paying you on time, but you might be still delivering late and he will always assert his right to claim damages. And the next example, this is something you usually encounter in big corporations. So there's often a mentality of saying no, of trying not to take risk, trying not to find solution. The thing is, especially for a lawyer, if, if a lawyer encounters a, a problem, also a tax lawyer, consultant, basically anyone in the company, um, it's nice to find a problem, but it's even better to find a solution. So in many cases, it's not enough to just say no. You are supposed to act in the interests of your company. So it's not enough to just exclude a risk if there is one, but at least to try to minimize the risk and find a workable solution. Again, taking a real life example from the legal context, we have here a yellow man, which is working in your company and an orange man working in the company. The orange man is not Donald Trump. And the yellow man and the orange man are respectively um, negotiating with some companies. So the yellow man is negotiating with company A, orange man is negotiating with company B. In that situation, for example, if company A and B are competitors, there might be some competition law and antitrust legal issues saying that the yellow man, the orange man, they might have, or the company might have a conflict of interest, which means there is no communication allowed between the yellow man and orange man about the negotiations with the customer. What I encounter in many situations like that is that somebody says no, either we just conclude one contract or non contract. But this is not the solution. Uh, the goal should always be to find a way to have a contract conclusion for yellow man and for orange man. So what is the problem here? The problem here is yellow and orange are not allowed to talk. And the solution is very simple. If two parties are not allowed to talk, just make them not talk. Lawyers and also in banking, we have this phenomenon, what companies have to construct is the so-called Chinese wall. So they have to implement uh, methods and ways to separate the yellow and the orange man in the technical way, organizational way. And these are sometimes very simple measures. Um, if you separate them from, or if you put them in both different offices, if they don't share the same um, cloud network, or not the same email accounts, it's already beginning how to make something like this work. Of course, there's always a risk involved because even with the best risk measures, with the best risk mitigation, 
you can never exclu exclude that at some point in time, the yellow man will just send a WhatsApp message to the orange man. But this is the risk you need to take. Coming to my final example, um, I will relate to COVID now and start with a very practical example. Imagine now a German company, which is supposed to supply goods to a Korean company. They conclude a sales contract um, and they don't decide on any applicable law. So they don't decide on German law, on Korean law. In those situations, in international transactions, the United Nations sales law applies. And this contract was concluded before the COVID-19 pandemic. Now the COVID-19 pandemic happens. The German supplier is unable to deliver its goods on time because the company closed down or because the shipping company was unable to ship the goods. Korean company incurs damages. What happens now? Um, the com companies look at the applicable law, they look at the contract, they find something in the United Nations sales law. The United Nations sales law basically says, if there's an impediment beyond control, an act of God, a party is generally speaking not liable. So in this case, everything went well for the German company. Um, everyone more or less than the legal world agrees. COVID-19 pandemic may be an impediment beyond control. It's all fine. We continue the situation. Okay, the parties agreed on everything. The delivery was finally done. Uh, the German company didn't pay damages. The Korean company was happy with those goods. The parties conclude a new contract during the COVID-19 pandemic. Same thing happens again, second shutdown in Germany. Um, Korean company incurs damages because the goods don't arrive in time. And now the Korean company is asking for damages. Um, but something has changed. The contract was concluded during the pandemic. And a question arises, if I conclude a con contract during a pandemic, can I really rely on the pandemic as grounds for excuse? Uh, the United Nations sales law gives you a really concise answer. It says that you're only not liable if the impediment you're relying on could not reasonably be expected. It means cannot be foreseeable. But if I enter a contract during a pandemic, that's the general agreement among legal scholars, then you cannot say it was not foreseeable. So what was the mistake done by the German lawyer? He didn't adapt to the situation. He learned once that he can rely on the United Nations sales law, but he didn't take into consider consideration the change circumstances. Risk management solution would have been here to take the COVID-19 pandemic into account and to stipulate a special contract clause just dealing with the COVID-19 matter. But this didn't happen in this case. So basically this is my conclusion. Once again, please try to get the full picture. So we're coming to the end. Um, we are slightly over time. So we have a couple of options and um, we can go slightly over time exceeding. Um, I would propose the following. Um, maybe first, we, I would like to mention our social media services. So um, we are offering a couple of um, exchanges. There is a mentoring program with a deadline for application next week that might be interesting for you. In case you would like to apply, we are very much looking forward to your applications. Secondly, uh, we also have other activities. There are more working groups with us. So if you follow our social media accounts and uh, reach out to Johannes, you might be able to join to learn more about what uh, is offered by the network. My proposal would be that we do a short round of what did you take from today? And then uh, if participants need to leave due to conflicting appointments, we can use like a few more minutes to cover questions and answers. Would that be all right for you? Okay, perfect. So my question for everyone would be, let's do it like in the beginning when we went through the list of participants, what was the most useful thing which you learned today and for you here? And I will start actually, I hope you don't mind. Um, I found it really useful um, from Professor Deville, the idea of like, you need to talk to many people to really get a sense of which kind of risks apply 
And the other thing I found very imaginable and very vivid was the picture Tobias just showed to us with the air airframe and uh, always thinking about the biases which impact our risk assessment. And I think I'm going to now hand over to Johannes. I'll be very brief. Uh, my, I'm just really happy about the participation and uh, this worked out. So my main takeaway is we should do it again. Perfect, then we proceed with Professor Zillinger. Very happy to be here and uh, I always uh, regret my job when I'm doing work with young people. I think I should have stayed at university, but on the other hand, all of you enter the professional life, uh, take the risk into account, but also uh, don't forget over the risks or opportunities. Stay entrepreneurial. Then we hand over to Johanna. Maybe not now. Then Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you to every speaker. Uh, for me, it was really interesting the different aspects of risk management and how like risk is in everyday life, like especially now during COVID-19. So it was really uh, interesting to hear the proposals or even the kind of like like MERS or uh, other in South Korea or North Korean aspects as well of risk management. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then we proceed with Rebecca. Uh, I thought it was really interesting to learn how risk is not um, a general expression and how risk adjusts to all kind of, kinds of political systems and um, societies and also to current situations like the pandemic. And I think that was really great to see in Dr. Seliger's presentation how actual crisis management is applied um, when you look at the water management um, or the threat that comes from North Korea. I thought of, that was a very good visualization, visualization of, uh, yeah, of the problem. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa Frachtendorf, would you like to proceed? Um, yes. Um, yeah, as I said in the beginning, uh, at first I didn't really know much about uh, risk management, but after, um, after the presentations, especially um, yeah, of um, Professor Deville and Dr. Seliger in the beginning, I realized that actually um, risk management is something really like omnipresent, like really surrounding so many things, not even just in everyday life, but also um, for like academically wise with the things I already studied. Now I have like a new perspective on it, which uh, is really interesting. And also I thought it was really good from all the contributions from the network. Uh, thank you for applying these things we learned in the beginning to specific, um, yeah, to more specific examples. Um, I could really take away a lot from this event. Thank you very much. Thank you as well. Let's proceed with Jan Robin. Uh, yes, uh, well, I could uh, take away from this uh, that uh, the research on risk is both uh, interdis interdisciplinary and case specific. That is, um, you have a broad range of different issues that are all concerned with risk. But if you want to go into detail of understanding one, you have to be really specific in defining what you're actually looking at. Otherwise, you get data without solutions. Thank you very much. Yun Jun Kim. You're still mute. No, unfortunately, I can't hear you. Now, Hello? yes, now it works. Yeah, this is my great opportunity to share my idea and discuss with all you guys. And I'm very honored to be here to present my idea as well. And the most useful thing I've learned here is then I can taste variety of the concept in case of risk management. Thank you for everybody. It was a great time. Thank you very much. Then to Julie Kim. Um, yeah, for me, I think uh, I was actually 
since I was cut short, I wasn't able to really discuss, get more deeply into the risk and risk management part of the immigration, which was, uh, that was unfortunate. But um, through this, this whole event, I was able to think about sort of the different sort of I, the scope of risk and, and the way I want to sort of um, adapt this to my paper is um, I got to think about like the competing sort of priorities of risk. Um, for me, it was like uh, the population risk and demographic risk compared to this COVID risk. How, how does that all come together in this sort of emergency? And, and so I think I was, I'm able to now develop my ideas a bit more. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Then to Ben van Trick. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for uh, the presentations. I think maybe the thing we can learn is after this one year where everybody had like a certain sense of fear towards the risk of getting infected, I think the idea of risk management, first of all, shows us that this risk affect us as single persons, but we need collective ideas to solve all these things. And I think we, what we can learn, I think, from each other is somehow like an architecture of risk. I think like, like what Mr. Zediger said with the dam or Mr. Kim said with the structures that are established to prevent risks is um, somehow what we can learn from each other are the structures that we build up uh, and that we might not can learn like how to respond to an event of risk that we don't know yet, but we can create and take over structures from our international friends. And I think that's somehow calming down because that means that we can manage risks together and learn. Thank you very much. Then to Professor Chi. I hope this time my pronunciation yes. was better. Yes, yes. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, can we you can. hear me? Yes. So, uh, I think what what struck me about to, today's uh, colloquium um, is how it relates to actually some of my uh, recent research. So, so actually, my recent research has been looking at the value of empathy in entrepreneurship, and I thought it was really interesting. The earliest bit this uh, today in today's colloquium, where we uh, learned a little bit about different kinds of categorizations of risk. So for example, natural risk and biometric risk and economic risk. And it really made me think about, and then of course, uh, and then digging deeper in, in all the other um, presentations. You know, my past research tends to look at how entrepreneurship relates to problem solving, but basically this colloquium has helped me think about how a categorization of risk can help us frame entrepreneurship in terms of suffering or potential suffering. And then the different ways in which entrepreneurs could learn how to empathize with people. Thank you very much. Then to Florian Perking. I also would like to thank you everybody for um, your contributions and the presenters as well as all everybody who asked questions and to try to delve more into the, um, the topic, which is, uh, as uh, Jan Zofinowski said, at the same time broad and very specific. And um, well, and uh, you gave us all many insights and many points on how to connect um, to our own research uh, and interests to the topic of risk management. Well, finally, also, thank you very much for setting up this networking um, environment and opportunity to get to know each other, specifically those of you who I only knew uh, from names, <laughs> but now knew uh, as uh, real persons. <laughs> Let's see how we get in touch in future. I would really like to do that. Thank you very much. And then we proceed with Diana. Yes, also thank you from my side, especially also to the junior scholars who brought some uh, different ideas about their own, um, own projects. And I, I wish you good luck with uh, all that you're up to. Um, so I found it also very interesting to look at risk from different perspectives because in my own research, I only look at the economic side. And so it was nice to also get the, the um, natural risk perspective um, and actually all the different areas that I did not have time to, to look into. And it's also not my discipline, but it's certainly inspiring and I hope I can make use of it. Um, and yeah, thank you also for the networking opportunity. Um, very many interesting people gathered here today, so it was um, 
time well spent. That's great. That's great to hear. We can proceed with Lisi. Yep. <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for today's uh, organizing um, today's uh, discussion and uh, good presentations. I thought uh, especially the um, Hyunjun Kim's presentation was interesting to learn uh, um, about the, some of the differences in the uh, origins of the U.S. and South Korea uh, response to the COVID-19. So it was uh, good to know. And <laughs> I hope all of you should stay safe and meet again some other day. Thank you. Thank you very much. We proceed with Edith. Uh, yeah, I don't have much to add, actually. I thought the presentations were very versatile, like very different. The last one was very interesting. And also uh, Mr. Zilika's um, presentation because he lives in Korea, he gave us a lot of um, insight from his experience. Um, yeah, and I didn't know that risk was such a profound word. I just use it in my everyday life, but I never knew it had such a deep, deep meaning. So yeah, it's very helpful for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alizia. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the main point that I learned and what really caught my eye is the research on communication uh, on this topic, including the different perspective of the um, nations and their behavior towards problems and the risk, of course. And I'm looking forward to work, work with the network in the future. Thank you very much. And then to Natalie. Um, yes, I think a very important point that was made um, is that risk perception depends on past experiences and in collective memories. Um, for example, you can see that especially in Czech Republic right now, um, how they handle the um, COVID-19. And um, you can see a, an extreme hostility toward the gov towards the government and um, somehow also uh, a fear um, to return to the to the socialist regime to the restricting regime so i thought that point was very interesting and also i i found nice to see that um, apparently um, north korea is improving in terms of risk management i mean if we when we look back at the famine um in the 90s um well there's the claim that the flood was responsible for the decrease of agricultural production and thus the famine. But I mean, there are many other um, factors that play into this. And one of them is also the incompetency of the government to handle this and to not see that as the Soviet Union is going to collapse and thus, yeah. So I found both aspects very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then to Professor Deville. Yeah. I um, congratulate you uh, to your excellent uh, um, presentations as well as to your excellent discussion uh, contributions. That was uh, really exciting for me. And uh, uh, the high diversity of topics which we have discussed, as well as the high diversity of people whom we are here in this type of uh, virtual meeting, that is outstanding. We don't have it very often in that way. Um, it was very well organized. So to um, uh, all of you, Johannes, Felix, and so on, uh, who were there, uh, congratulations to that. So I, I would like to conclude, have fun and have success, both fun and success personally with your and, uh, things you are uh, doing right now, but also fun and success in the network, which has started right now. So all the best. Thank you very much. And maybe Tobias for the last one, if I have forgot some. Okay, I, I will make it quick. Uh, quick. I love the facets of the uh, issue of risk management, and I wish both PhD researchers, Henry and Julie, a lot of luck, and I hope they will keep on the hard work and finish their thesis soon. Thank you very much. Have I forgot someone?
No, then I have one proposal. Instead of having a discussion, asking questions as we're over time, we could again hand over to Julie to share her conclusions and then end our event. So Julie, if you would like to proceed and finish this and everyone who needs to drop off, please feel free, uh, you would have the opportunity. But would you like to or would you rather not to? I actually just wanted to sort of, um, if, if, there were t if there was time, I would wanted to sort of have ideas and, and discuss when what I just mentioned before about this competing priority of risk. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, when, when something like the COVID happens and, and um, it sort of seems to cover up all the other sort of problems that were there before, um, how, how do we how do we continue to deal with the risk that was there before and and um and sort of bring it to the fore and 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 sort of adapt to the new situation that we have and i i just yeah i just wanted to sort of throw out the idea and and had a just have a discussion it, yeah so that was my conclusion <laughs> yeah thank you and with this, I think we can come to the end. Um, if you have feedback, new ideas, also for further topics, I think you might also want to reach out to our uh, email, to the event list. This can be a great inspiration if there is something on your mind. And apart from this, I would like to thank everyone. I would like to thank our presenters. I would like to thank Johannes and Mr. Koshik, who is unfortunately not with us today. I wish you all a great night in Korea, morning in the US and uh, afternoon in Germany. Take care, stay healthy, and I hope to see you soon. <laughs>